Uh, Councillor Pooley, we're ready to start the meeting when you're ready. Yes, thank you. Oh, hang on, I've got to turn my mobile phone off. I'm going to get an echo otherwise. OK, that's off. So has the meeting begun, Brian? Uh, yes, Councillor, we're underway. OK, thank you for that. Sorry about the slight delay. Uh, good evening and welcome to this meeting of the Chelmsford Policy Board. Uh, a, a big welcome to members of the public, uh, to representatives of various uh, the parish councils and parish uh, and local groups, and clearly to officers and members of, uh, of both uh, of the City Council and indeed to some officers of the County Council as well. So welcome to you all. I'd like to remind everyone that this meeting is being recorded and streamed live on our website. We are getting used to these remote meetings, but sometimes glitches do occur. So please bear with us should that happen during the meeting. I'd like to remind those taking part of a few things. Hopefully you're taking part from a place where you will not be disturbed or distracted. When they're not actively participating in the meeting, I would ask members and officers to keep their audio and video turned off. Anyone wishing to speak should type an H in the chat box and I will call them when it is their turn. All questions and contributions must come through the chair, please. And remember to turn your video and audio to speak. Any councillor with an interest in any item should declare it and keep their audio and video off when it's being considered. They will not be included in any vote on the subject. When it comes to a decision on any of the recommendations or motions before us, I will assume that if no one says that they oppose them, everyone will be in agreement. If anyone says that they are opposed, I will ask for a formal vote to be conducted. If we lose the live stream on the website, I will adjourn the meeting for 20 minutes and hopefully the problem can be fixed. If not, I will adjourn the meeting until a future date. On that note, I do need to just alert uh, people online here that my own IT is letting me down a little bit today and I won't be seeing the H's in the chat box necessarily so reliably. So, uh, Mr. Mayfield, I will ask, I may ask to, uh, for your help in pointing me in the direction of some hands that are raised. But I seem to be OK at the moment uh, and my laptop is not overheating. So back to you, Mr. Mayfield. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Just to confirm uh, the members of the uh, policy board present at the meeting, there are councillors Helen Ayres, uh, Nicolette Chambers, Wendy Dayton, Ian Fuller, Marie Goldman, Simon Goldman, Neil Gulliver, Barry Knight, Rose Moore, yourself, Chair, Graham Pooley, Richard Porter, Ian Roberts, Mike Steele, who's substituting for Councillor Galley, who sends his apologies, Andrew Sozin, Nora Walsh and Roy Whitehead. Um, the officers present uh, are Keith Nicholson, Director of Public Places, and from Planning Services, uh, Jeremy Potter, Claire Stuckey, 
Matthew Parry, uh, Neil Jordan and Jenny Robinson. There are various other uh, councillors and officers present at the meeting and they may well be speaking uh, during the course of it. And there are also a number of members of the public who are here to ask questions and representatives from uh, parish councils and other local ward councillors. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. So that comes to agenda item two, declarations of interest. All members are reminded that they must disclose any interest that they know they have in items of business on the meeting's agenda, and that they must do so at this point on the agenda or as soon as they become aware of the interest. If the interest is a dis uh, disclosable pecuniary interest, they're obliged to notify the monitoring officer within 28 days of the meeting. Are there any members present who would need to declare an interest? Thank you very much. Takes us to agenda item three, which is the minutes of the previous meeting of the 4th of June, which you have all had in front of you in your agenda packs. Uh, I uh, ask whether those may be signed as a correct record of that meeting. Agreed. Without dissent, I take that as agreement. Thank you very much, which brings us to agenda item four, uh, public questions. Any member of the public may ask a question or make a statement at this point in the meeting, provided that they have been invited to participate in this meeting and have submitted their question or statement in writing and in advance. Each person has two minutes and a maximum of 15 minutes is allotted to public questions and statements overall, which need to be about matters for which the board is responsible. I may disallow a question if it's offensive, substantially the same as another question or requires the disclosure of exempt or confidential information. And if the question cannot be answered at the meeting, a written response will be provided after the meeting. Any member of the public who wishes to submit a question or statement to this meeting uh, will have emailed it to uh, the email address on the council 24 hours in advance. All valid questions and statements uh, have been published with the agenda on the website. Uh, during the course of today uh, and will be responded to at the meeting. Those who've submitted a valid question or statement are entitled to put it in person at this meeting, provided they've indicated that they wish to do so and have submitted an email address, which I know some of you have, uh, and, uh, an and have received an invitation to join the meeting so that you can do that. So I... <clears throat> I say at this point that for those of you who have a public question uh, or statement that relates to a particular agenda item, you may wish to leave it until we get to that agenda item. But at this point, I'll pass back to Mr. Mayfield to uh, to see if there are members of the public who wish to ask their question or statement now. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I don't think anybody's indicated that they wish to ask their statement now, unless anybody uh, wishes to do so, in which case they should uh, indicate by turning on their microphone. Okay, thank you. So we'll look forward to those questions and statements as we come to the particular agenda items. And I know that that will be the case with the first item that we come to, agenda item five, uh, which is uh, the, the consideration of the master plan in respect of the strategic site allocation two. Uh, West Chelmsford Warren Farm. Uh, at this point, I just want to set out the, pro the process that I'm going to follow for this and the subsequent item, agenda item six, so that we can uh, have a meeting in a reasonably orderly fashion. <laughs> Uh, the first the first thing that would normally happen in this situation, which I would ask to happen, is that the officer responsible for the, the development of the master plan at this point will make a presentation about it. And, uh, at that point, uh, at that point, uh, I'll invite the public who are wishing to make a statement or, or read a question to do so, uh, or Brian Mason Field will read that out. Following which, uh, I would do the same in relation to uh, to parish councils and ward councillors. Uh, and, and at that stage, officers may wish to respond to some aspects of the questions that have been raised by, by those persons. And at that point, the policy board uh, at large will then debate the item and other members may be willing to pop in. I know that we do have present with us the cabinet member for sustainable development, Councillor McCrory, uh, and I would ask him if he wishes to speak uh, before 
uh, before the um, the debate on the policy board itself gets underway or during it. But we'll get to that when we get there. So first and foremost, I'd like to hand to the relevant officer who will introduce himself and make a presentation on Warrell Farm on the master plan as it now stands. Uh, Chair, before we move on to that, I believe uh, Councillor Knight has indicated a wish to speak. I don't know if it was a possibly earlier item. Oh, uh, forgive me, Councillor Councillor Knight. I think uh, you you put, I see you put your hand up. By all means, tell us what you were going to say. I'm not hearing him. Is anybody else hearing him? Uh, no, Chair, I don't think he's audible at the moment. Um, OK, well, if we if we come back to that, we will at some stage, no doubt. Uh, it is possible that he's wishing to declare an interest. That's the only other item that has been happening before this. Uh, so we'll see how we go. Anyway, so to the officer, please, to make the presentation on Warren Farm. Thank you, Chair. My name is uh, Matthew Perry, Senior Planning Officer within the Strategic Development Team within Chelmsford City Council. Um, I'm going to do a brief presentation today on the Master Plan for West Chelmsford, a Strategic Growth Site 2, as uh, noted within the uh, local plan. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen to run through a quick presentation. Just bear with me, everyone. So in terms of policy requirements, this, as you see on screen, is a summary from the local plan. These are points, but just to give everyone a flavour of what the content of the local plan is. So um, the allocation is for around 800 new homes, um, travelling show person site for five service plots with separate access. Um, I may well use the acronym TSP, so that uh, denotes travelling show person site, just for a benefit of everyone. Um, also included is a new primary school, nursery and neighbourhood centre. Furthermore, bus, cycle and pedestrian links into the urban area, new pedestrian cycle connections, wider field, new public open space, sport, recreation and community space, along with highways improvements, including crossing of rocks or road. So that's just a brief flavour. I'm now going to go on to the actual plan itself and just do a quick discussion. So this is the illustrative master plan as submitted within the master plan document. I'm just going to pull out a few of those just so everyone is familiar with um, where we are and where things are planning to go. So hopefully you can all see my cursor. This is rocks or road um, along the south. Uh, this is the chicken estate to the east part of the current urban area so the red line allocation is is shown uh, wrapping around the site as so with the western segment um, allocated for recreational suds within the local plan um, policy in terms of um, the content of the master plan i'm just going to run through um, kind of sequentially where things are and, and what things mean in terms of the Western segment, the content includes um, a travelling show person site shown in brown in the western corner. Um, this is shown with a separate access, but I'll come on to that, that point later on. Um, including within the Western segment, we have ecology parks, grasslands, um, play areas, as well as um, sports and recreation in the form of football pitches with um, um, cricket cricket within the centre and a sports pavilion. Just moving on further around to the east, you'll see that the, the site is roughly split with a with a green space arc that runs through the centre. That consists of um, pumping station in the lower east corner and serves attenuation ponds to reflect the, topo the topography in this location. Obviously you have the flood zone further to the east um, for the brook in that location. So the, the, the green arc arcs around the site are so roughly splits um, residential parcels roughly in half. 
in the centre of the site we have a um, school with neighbourhood centre which is uh, roughly dissected by uh, a rear line public um, footpath. Um, just to the right of that we have Centenary Way footpath um, which kind of dissects the eastern, eastern segments of the site. Um, other things shown within um, the master plan are the primary route which is intended to come from a new enlarged roundabout off, off the top of Lordship Road and that primary route loops um, around both the school and neighbourhood centre as well as touching the um, northern segment of the residential parcels loops around back out to a new uh, roundabout created um, just east of um, the car wash if uh, people are familiar with that and obviously the SO station for sorry, the BP station further further down. So that gives a, a rough flavour of, of, of what we see within the master plan. Obviously, as part of discussion, I'm happy to come back to the plan or, or other elements of the plan as, as we go through. Um, just picking up on, 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 on some, some of the comments from representations, a um, few, few key issues um, to, to note here. I'm just going to not skip forward, but in terms of the Travelling show person site, um, its location as well as access as 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 coming for some criticism in terms of the representation. So I anticipate some tailored debate on that this evening. Um, one of the other key elements is is the bus link that you see um, diagrammatically on, on this plan, but just to the east, which serves the Warren Farm development and breaks through into Avon Road. Obviously, we have numerous representations on this point, so I anticipate some further debate um, on, on that point. The the other key element that is um, uh, has come out of, of, of consultations is the is the buffering, not only to the north side, but specifically to the south side. I know there's a petition on that on that point in terms of is the depth great enough to to serve this development along Roxar Road. So those are some of the just the key consultation issues and and this is obviously summarised. We do have a, a green sheet which is is very much expanded from the officer report, which expands upon both public representations and the public bodies, so the parish councils and the Chicken Estates Residents Association. Um, that green sheet document does summarise those comments, and we do have um, council response on the public body um, elements of those, so um, we can refer to that as and when. So the key consultation issues, as I say, th this is summarised, this is not intended to be a summary of all that list. The list is there for everyone to see, however, this is intended as a, as a as a direction to policy board almost, because there are areas that um, officers feel um, we, we are in a we're in a place whereby we're not suggesting any further changes as part of the report. You know that the recommendations with sorry the further design considerations within the report are highlighted at the end of each each kind of segment, each kind of theme summary. Um, so these, you know, those those areas are areas where we feel officers aren't, aren't quite content with where we are and obviously the recommendation reflects that in terms of delegation um, on, those time, on those items. However, these are just some key points um, to pull out where, where we feel that officers are, are content where we are on these three issues in terms of bus link, travelling show person site and the landscape buffer. But obviously that I anticipate they'll be subject to some further debate. Just on the green sheet, it is, it is worth noting that also there were two petitions, um, one from Chicken Estates Residents Association, also one from Whittle Residents, and I understand we have someone speaking on those this evening. Thank you, Chair. I'm just going to revert back to you, if that's OK. And thank you very much for that. Just to reiterate a couple of aspects as to where we are in the master plan process, for the, just to remind us as members, <clears throat> and also to alert members of the public and others. Uh, this is not a decision-making board in this context. Uh, the recommendations are that we should consider recommending this to Cabinet for its approval. And where we are in the process is quite clearly that the site has been agreed and is within the local plan as, in principle, available for development of the type which is described by the master plan. Uh, and so 
And so what we're looking to do here is not question the allocation within the local the local plan, but debate and question, if necessary, the way in which that uh, that is reflected in the master plan in order to make the very best use of that possibility for the future residents of that site and also for the surrounding residents. So in that context, I'm sure that the uh, I've seen most of the questions in advance and I'm sure that they will be put in that way and that the debate will be conducted in that way. So uh, again, Mr Mayfield, if I could ask you to invite the public questions or read the ones that uh, are going to be read out, invite them in the order that you choose. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, the first question from the public we have on this item is from Joanne Hawkins, who I believe is present to put it in person. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, good evening. Um, yeah, my name is Joanne Hawkins. I'm representing Chicken Love State Residents Association this evening. Um, I'm going to read a short statement, if that's OK, and then ask a question at the end. Throughout my statement, the Chicken Love State Residents Association will be referred to as CIRA. Um, so these, the statement is in regard we, uh, to the bus link. Um, the supporting agenda report for um, agenda item five includes the following statement at the end of paragraph 3.12. The detail submitted to date demonstrates that the route is workable from a highways and safety pers perspective. Um, firstly, a recent consultation meetings held on the 22nd of June and the 1st of July um, as well as CIRA submissions via email to the design team and onto the planning portal, evidence was provided um, clearly demonstrating that the scheme does not comply with the minimum standards set out in the Essex Design Guide for cycle paths and footpaths. Um, Hilary Grove has kindly advised CIRA recently that the national and local highway standards allow for um, the reduction of footpaths um, to uh, two metres down to a minimum of one metre and that this scenario is deemed to be acceptable to the highways authority for the expected level of pedestrians using the bus link. CIRA understands that yes a reduction of footpath um, width is permitted within the standards um, in exceptional circumstances such as obstructions but even then only for short distances and where footfall is low. The current design shows a 1.5 metre wide footpath for 30 metres in length against a wall with a pinch point of 1.2 metres um, at certain points with two schools, among other numerous amenities either side of the bus gate, as well as it forming part of a main cycle route. Secondly, the road safety audit is issued and uh, was issued sorry, on behalf of CIRA um, on the 6th of July. It's incomplete and shows incorrect vehicle tracking and swept path analysis. It does not include buses turning right into the bus gate or turning left out of the bus gate, which are the tightest and most difficult maneuvers at this junction. Um, so we don't know if the buses are going to be able to access the proposed junction. This is despite Hillary, Hillary Gore advising Sarah recently that the plans are achievable and acceptable in principle. Thirdly, and lastly, um, among others, the road safety audit also formally identified and scheduled in the report problems with bus access being restricted by parking levels and highlighted problems with pedestrian safety. Yet the vast majority, if not all of the design mitigations in the road safety audit have been ignored um, and not included in the current bus gate proposal. These are only some of the problems with the bus gate design. There is no evidence confirming the proposals are not in breach of pollution levels, lux levels, noise nuisance levels, privacy of neighbouring properties or is viable without damage to adjacent properties during construction and general use amongst, amongst many other offers. Um, I'm sorry, amongst, amongst many other issues. There will be approximately 2,500 people living on Warren Farm with the ecology parks, schools and medical centres and potential businesses. Um, consider, if you will, the following scenario. A class of 30 children from Law, uh, from Law Mead School walking via the bus gate to the Ecology Park on Warren Farm with pedestrians, families with pushchairs, dog walkers and cyclists. Cyclists cannot mount the narrow footpath because of the pedestrian traffic, so they must stay on the road. Then add in a bus trying to navigate this gap safely. These are the spatial standards we should be designing for. 
We designed to support future use and expansion, not to match current or previous levels, with no room to expand the bus gate at all. As Chelmsford grows west of Warren Farm, the non-vehicle usage will grow significantly and so the pedestrian safety will get worse and worse. We can provide below minimum guidelines, Sierra absolutely agrees that, but surely on wide open routes only, not ones that are extremely space restricted and have to cater for high levels of footfall, large population increases and two primary schools on either side. Um, finally, my question, and I appreciate your patience in listening to that statement, why are we being advised that the details demonstrated in the scheme are workable and safe as the relevant minimum spatial standards, vehicle tracking analysis and road safety audit categorically do not show the current scheme as workable and safe? Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I'll just come in at this point to thank you for that statement. Yes, I was a little bit patient in, your, in, in terms of time, but I appreciate that you've brought together the views of a number of your residents and that there's not a parish council in that particular area. So you're doing the job of both uh, the public and from the parish council point of view in that, uh, in that sense. So we appreciate that. I am going to take the officer responses to these questions at the end of the public questions and at the end of some input from local councillors. I hope that's acceptable to you. <clears throat> and obviously, uh, officers, please do make a careful note of the questions as they arise. I know that we have uh, officer also, officers all here also from the County Highways Department. So at the appropriate moment, I'll be asking for responses both from our own officers and from the County Council, if that's acceptable. Mr Mayfield. Thank you, Chair. Um, the next member of the public who wishes to speak is uh, John Whitlock, who organised one of the petitions referred to uh, by Mr Perry earlier. Um, under our petition scheme, he's allowed to speak uh, for rather longer than um, uh, ordinary uh, public questions, uh, which are limited to two minutes. He has up to 15 minutes, but um, I don't know how long he intends to take, but um, uh, he, he is entitled to that time. Uh, if he wishes to use it. So over to Mr Whitlock. Good evening. Um, can, can, I, can you see me? Because I, I just see uh, BM on the screen. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, that's fine. Okay. okay. Right, thank you. Yes, so um, I don't anticipate taking uh, 15 minutes. Um, I only uh, received the um, invitation today uh, by email, just by way of explanation, so I haven't had a lot of time to prepare. I was actually at a fishing bank, so I've uh, put some thoughts together and, and hopefully it will come across fairly uh, coherent. So I'd like to thank the committee for this invitation and opportunity to speak to the petition um, that uh, was put together for a Rittle residence. Uh, just uh, to explain a little about myself, I'm a resident of Rittle Village, uh, a place I and my family adore. Uh, professionally, I'm a town planner for my sins with some 40 years experience in councils in Essex. Uh, I'm uh, so professionally, I'm very familiar with development schemes and believe I speak to the petition with an insight of development and planning processes and with a large measure of authority. Um, the aim of the petition, I, I, don't, I haven't seen your paperwork. Uh, I don't know if you've got the heading of the petition, but I'll just run through it, um, was to minimize the visual impact and intrusion on Rittle Village and the rural setting by, one, retaining the rural character along the entire uh, Roxwell Road frontage of the site with a substantially increased open green buffer in the region of 120 to 90 metres uh, between the development and the road. And two, together with low density housing of no more than two storeys high along the entire southern frontage uh, and the return western boundary to the, the, to the green belt. Uh, I gathered the petition in the autumn of 2018, um, just kind of rowing everyone back a little bit, because that's when the original master plan was consulted on with public meetings. Uh, indeed, that was prior to 
um, consideration of the local plan and uh, its examination in public. Um, all the signatories are physical signatories uh, gathered on residence doorsteps uh, or at shops, etc. Um, I personally got almost all of them, um, in, as I say, in the autumn of 2018. Uh, I discouraged non-Rittle residents from signing it because I didn't want to weaken its message. Uh, and there are in excess of 1,000 signatures from Rittle residents. I suggest that is a significant number uh, from a small village. Uh, quite honestly, if uh, time and daylight in the autumn of uh, 2018 would have allowed, it could have easily been far more. Uh, the message really resonated with, with residents. Um, you'll note from what I said about the petition, it's not an anti-development uh, message. It's just trying to work with the council to influence the uh, design and character of the development uh, to bear in mind that it's also the gateway to the village, uh, the rural village of uh, Rittle. And it seeks to engage with, with um, sorry, with Chelmsford uh, City Council to influence this character uh, to soften the urban extension uh, of the 800 houses and so forth. So that kind of happened, as I say, autumn of 18. Uh, there was obviously the local plan public inquiry, uh, probably in 19 sometime or the late uh, 18. Um, and then it went into hibernation. And the only thing um, the public have heard, I've heard, was a letter four weeks ago uh, consulting me on the um, a revised uh, master plan, and it did have a pamphlet setting it out and explaining it was provided by the council because of the coronavirus problem of seeing things, uh, which was appreciated. Um, but alas, on the, the new scheme, because the master plan of 18 is now cancelled on your files. You have a new master plan, which has less information, but the separation hasn't changed. So the plea from the residents of Rissell really hasn't been heard. Um, however, on the, the secondary point, the housing density along the frontage has in fact increased from that in the original master plan. If you have the document, if you look at page 29, it can be seen that the, uh, entire periphery uh, on to Roxwell Road and to the west onto the countryside was going to be low density, whereas now uh, significant areas of it uh, are medium and high density, so increasing its impact, particularly around the two access points and the prominent position as you come out the village up uh, Lordship Road to the mini roundabout where the sunflowers are, that's going to be very prominent uh, on rising ground. Um, also, the building heights have increased. They were shown at two storey in the original master plan. Now they're two and a half and three storey, uh, compounding the impact rather than softening, soften, softening it. Um, I understand from my discussions in the past with the officers, there are two main reasons not to increase the green buffer. One is the need to provide the um, 800 homes and other development. Well, I would respectfully submit that the original master plan, which had lower densities across the entire site, clearly would have achieved the 800. Also, the local plan examination in public, the council's lead officer made it clear across the city, not just this site, that the um, quantum of development quoted for each site was not an upper limit and expected there to be flexibility embedded in the plan so the number would increase 10, 20 percent or so. Uh, clearly by enlarging this green buffer as, as requested, there is still scope within the site, within the developable area, the red area for development uh, to still provide the 800 houses because as things stand, more than 800 are going to be provided in, long, in the long term. 
The second point um, is a highway's preference to be able to view the houses along the frontage, which they would like to have to aid the provision of the 40 mile per hour speed limit. Um, well, if they're moved back as suggested, they'll still be viewed. Perhaps you also have heard about the bus gate, well you have of course, uh, from, from the other residents. Uh, and as with the bus gate, it's not proven from a highway perspective that the houses cannot be moved back and a 40 mile per hour, uh, which is the ambition to provide that speed limit along the Roxwell Road, uh, cannot be achieved. Uh, nor does the highway policy preclude, preclude um, a 40 mile per hour speed limit and the houses being moved back. Um, sorry, I'm just gathering my thoughts here. Um, indeed, there are many examples of such roads with 40 mile per hour speed limits. Uh, in fact, the Lordship Road, which leads from the roundabout where the sunflowers are back into Rittle for much of its length is 40 miles per hour and there aren't buildings close to it. They're far further back than it would be if the committee agreed with the suggestion of moving these back. Uh, I submit increasing the green buffer as asked by the residents and not is not mutually exclusive with achieving the 800 homes nor the 40 mile per hour speed limit. Uh, I would point out one example that this council approved um, in relatively recent times is the original Bewley Park. Uh, when that development went ahead, um, there is a green buffer in front of it around the uh, 90 metres, 100 metres. In fact, I think it's got a park within it, but from the road has a very rural feel. Um, I hope the committee um, understands the perspective of the Rittle residents. Uh, and, you know, if we can't achieve, you know, 90 or 100 metres, perhaps 50 or 60 metres, doubling it um, is, is, is achievable. Uh, I therefore ask that the committee consider the petitioner's request and ask the officers to negotiate its ambitions with the developer for inclusion in the final master plan to be submitted to cabinet uh, in September. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you also for the uh, amount of interest which you helped generate within the village <clears throat> for what is obviously a very significant uh, development that's intended on this particular site. So that is appreciated. My same similar comments apply that I'm sure that officers will pick up the points raised and that the policy board will discuss it when that time arrives. Mr Mayfield. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, the next speaker is uh, Councillor Chris Hibbett on behalf of uh, Riffle Parish Council. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, can everybody hear me all right? Yes, Chris. OK, fine. Uh, this is Chris Hibbett, Chairman of Riddle Parish Council. Um, Riddle Parish Council has objected to the Warren Farm site since it was first announced in October 2015. The principal reason has always been the potential increase in traffic congestion due to vehicle entry and exit to the site onto the Roxwell Road. However, since the adoption of the local plan and the endorsement by the City Council, we accept that this site will progress but we believe that there are major traffic issues that are still to be resolved and addressed before the building commences. In the master plan, there are detailed references to alterations to the A1060. These include the two roundabouts, the Puffing Crossing, but there are no reference at all to any improvements to Lordship Road. Traffic survey done in October 2018 by Vectus on behalf of Cress Nicholson produced an eight point plan to address the key issues relating to Lordship Road. For those that don't know, this road leads from the Green in Rittle to the junction of the A1060 opposite the proposed site. In this stretch of road, there is Rittle University College, major buildings on both sides of the road, and therefore a lot of traffic crossing the road, students 
and, and, and other people as well. There is a doctor's surgery with restricted visibility for entry and exit, and there have been three major accidents there in the last two years. Also, more recently, a major industrial site has been developed within the college land by Crawfords Limited, with traffic exiting onto Lordship Road via the narrow Foxborough Lane. Large tractors and agricultural machinery regularly leave and enter this site. We believe that reference must be made in the master plan to the issues relating to Lordship Road, as well as the A1060. Apart from local traffic, it's a major road link to the M11 and the A12, and will be extensively used by new traffic from the Warren Farm Estate. The improvements must be, these improvements must be confirmed and incorporated at the start of the building program. Secondly, throughout the last five years, in all the consultations relating to this site, it has always been stated that for a development of this size, there must be an exit entry via both the A1060 and Avon Road. If this does not happen, the validity of the site must be in doubt. From the very first site plan back in five years ago to the current master plan today, the exit entry for buses has always been clearly shown in that position. If this was the, if this was the case of two major consultations and all the public exhibitions that took place over this period, and we believe it's essential that this is not changed at this late stage. Also in the master plan, the creation of the bus gate is in the last phase of the building plan. This would mean that for several years, 400 plus houses will be built with only traffic exiting and entering via the 1060. Essex County Council in their response to the master plan in the consultation has stated that bus gate must be completed before the 100th house is completed. We strongly support this. We have evidence from the independent traffic survey on both these issues, and they are critical to the viability of this site. And therefore we trust that the issues relating to Lordship Road will be addressed and that buses will leave and enter the site by Avon Road as planned. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And again, our, our appreciation of the fact that this has been a, an active area of discussion uh, on the Parish Council and with your residents. Uh, and this is a good illustration, of course, that, that what we're looking for here is the best uh, achievable alternative and that there won't be perfection that meets everybody's, uh, everybody's ideas around each site. So with that in mind, the debate will unfold as we go along, but clearly the points are well made. <coughs> And, and much appreciated. Mr Mayfield, are we now moving to local members? Is that correct? We are, Chair. Um, Councillor Roper and Councillor Robinson have both uh, indicated they wish to speak, so perhaps Councillor Roper first. Okay. Councillor Roper. Can anyone else hear him? I can't at the moment. You're muted, Tim. I think Chair uh, Councillor Roper is experiencing the same difficulties he encountered at uh, Planning Committee the other night with his uh, audio. Um, Ah oh, yes, okay, yes, th yes. Thank you. I'd, I'd, I'd understood that he had managed to uh, <coughs> deal with those between that meeting and this meeting, but I sympathise. If he wishes to enter some any particular questions in the chat box, then that is more than uh, available to him, and the officers can pick the questions up in that way. But let, <coughs> let's ask Councillor Robinson to speak, and then if that audio problem has been resolved, we can go back to Councillor Roper. Councillor Robinson. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, good evening. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of um, the three uh, St Andrews Ward councillors. Um, we've always opposed the development of this site for housing. My group voted against it at every stage and still think it's the wrong location. 
for many reasons, but particularly because of the impact on the local area, um, in particular on the traffic issues. And to that extent, I agree with what uh, Chris Hibbert has just said. Um, however, as he also said, we accepted that once other members of the council voted to include it in the final submission plan um, on the 19th of June 2018, um, it was going uh, to be, it was going to happen. Um, so it's now earmarked for development. And this master plan gives us the chance to achieve the best outcomes possible for both new and existing residents. And as local ward councillors, we are committed to that. We need to ensure that um, existing communities benefit and are enhanced from this development as well as delivering the new community. And we've had several meetings and correspondence with residents over the past two years and have listened to and taken seriously their concerns and objections. I have a few minor points uh, to make about the master plan and we'll come to those towards the end, but I want to concentrate on the bus link issue. Um, if I may and bear with me, I'm going to I'd like to try and share my screen um, so you can see the aerial view um, of uh, of the location. Um, so I think you can now see a map with chair. Can you see that? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes, Councillor Robinson, I can. Yeah, thank you. So you can see this is um, the Warren Farm development site. If I just zoom in, this is where um, the bus link is proposed to go here. Um, you can see this um, extensive tree cover, um, the children's play area, the football pitch and the allotments. And if I zoom right in, you can see that this is where it's proposed to build the bus link um, between these two houses. And um, the, the existence of this bus link only became widely known during the first round of consultation on the master plan. Technical evidence or modeling in support of the proposal has been virtually non-existent. Despite many requests over the last two years, transport analysis of different options for bus routes or links has never been provided. Residents and councillors have had to make do with being told that it is the best option without explanation. The principle of improving access to non-car transport, cycling, walking, taxis, as well as buses, is of course vital to delivering a more sustainable community. However, the first ever publicly available detailing of the proposal is that contained in this master plan, which is on page 45 of your agenda, figure 16, which I, th I think I'm now showing you. You can see there um, that uh, as quite a substantial embankment would be required, a big bridge over the stream, a couple of ramps down into the play area and the allotments before it narrows and goes between the houses. This plan has raised for us more issues of concern, serious concern, and more questions than it answers. And so we continue to oppose, oppose this proposal because the following issues haven't been addressed satisfactorily. And, and some of this Joanne Hawkins referred to earlier, and I'd like to thank Sierra for the work they've done on, on this. On, as regards safety, we haven't been assured that the bus link will be safe for all. The narrow space will be shared by buses, cyclists and pedestrians. And from evidence you've just seen uh, uh, submitted uh, from the association, it appears that the width available between the houses on Avon Road is below recommended standards. One of the more puzzling comments made in support of the scheme is that on the one hand, it will be low traffic and therefore low conflict with pedestrians and vehicles. But on the other hand, it's a great initiative and that will be used a great deal by cyclists and pedestrians. And we feel that the conflict between cyclists, pedestrians and vehicles is unacceptable. Safety on Avon Road was also referred to by Joanne Hawkins, turning in and out of a congested road with regular bot with bottlenecks. Um, at this point, I'd like to note that uh, the residents have always supported the cycle path and footpath at this location, but not this bus link. And it will also lead to the loss of established green space. The houses on Avon Road and the development site are separated by a well-established area of woodland, which you saw on the map, which is home to numerous species of wildlife. And residents are immensely proud of this area. 
Fourthly, the negative impact on the living conditions of existing residents. It was uh, there's pollution to be concerned about as the bus link would cut through green space and between the houses. Parking would be lost on on Avon Road. Fifthly, I'd say the visual impact of the engineering solution. This is a very heavily engineered solution. This is a, on the map, on the plan, you can see this is a large embankment. The proposed bridge would be at a significant height above the level of the play area. A single lane would be bad enough, but this is a two lane bridge which will have a dramatic impact and will be wider than most, if not every other example of a bus gate that has been quoted as comparable. And if I can show you two images, that shows you a van and the van is slightly smaller than a bus. That is the uh, exit or entrance that the buses would be taking. And the red line indicates the height of the, of the proposed road bridge. And I think this is unacceptable. I'd also make a more general point that just putting in some infrastructure for buses does not lead to a large uptake in bus use. And that's backed up by various research papers that I've seen in the last few days, including ones from the Department for Transport, the Urban Transport Group and Transport Research Laboratory, which concluded bus priority schemes alone do not seem to loosen people's attachment to the car. Now, residents of the area have said they fully accept there should be a cycle and pedestrian link at this location. And we should indeed have a much greater emphasis on a dramatic increase in cycling provision between Warren Farm and every other part of Chelmsford. There are existing cycle paths that should be linked up to the new development. And I believe that would actually represent much better value for money and benefit many more people. I'd also draw attention to the council's own planning policies DC4 about protecting existing amenity, that all development proposals should safeguard the amenities of occupiers of nearby properties, that traffic management um, should facilitate the safe and efficient movement of people, um, and that it should be safe. And protecting amenity development proposals must safeguard the amenities of the occupiers of nearby residential property. So I think our own policies potentially are in conflict with this proposal now that we can see the detail. Just a couple of other areas. You can see on the photo the Avon Road play area. This is desperately in need of upgrading. Everyone agrees that it needs to be upgraded. Plans for upgrading the play area should be, uh, should be drawn up now in consultation with the residents and options presented to the public. And doing it now in advance of the development would demonstrate commitment to enhance facilities for existing residents. Connections to the wider area should be made more explicit in the master plan. And to that extent, I think Councillor Hibbett mentioned things like that. Um, the wider area around the development site, for example, there's only one reference to Highland School in the document, and that's in a representation from the parish council. It's disappointing to see no reference in the master plan to how young people from the development site will access Highland School in a safe and sustainable way. And as regard low or zero carbon development, Crest tell us that sustainable development is a high priority. And the government recently announced the phasing out of gas central heating and petrol and diesel engines in the middle distance. Now would be a good opportunity for Crest to show that they are genuinely true to their word about a sustainable community. And Crest should offer, offer residents the opportunity to buy into green energy and other energy saving measures. And it's disappointing that they were unenthusiastic in their response when we had the meeting with them. The City Council has declared a climate and ecology emergency, and that needs to be taken into account and action plans are, 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 are respected accordingly. I come to the end by saying that this process has been a learning exercise for me, but I think it's also a good example of the importance of the master plan process and so I'd strongly urge all ward members to get engaged with the master plan process if it affects their area so that issues and concerns can be addressed before they become set in stone at planning application stage. So to sum up, the principle of a bus link sounds OK, but the more we've seen of the detail, the more concerns arise. The mitigation proposed are not enough to overcome the shortcomings and therefore, I hope that the policy board will uh, make an additional recommendation 
that the policy board accepts that there are significant doubts about the safety, viability and benefits of the bus link and will therefore refer all the sustainable transport elements for this development to officers and agree if necessary to convene a special meeting of the board to review those elements of the master plan before being presented to the cabinet. And uh, I very much hope that members on the board will support that. Um, I hope I haven't uh, taken too long. Um, I hope that was helpful. Thank you very much for your time, members. Thank you. It's clearly the major uh, element that, uh, that the board will want to debate in the context of this master plan. And there are uh, competing uh, perspectives from your local uh, member colleagues and uh, those in Rittle. I don't know whether Councillor Roper is back online, but I see that I see that Councillor Watson has put his hand up. So I suggest maybe willing to substitute in that respect. Is that right, Councillor Watson or Councillor Roper? Yeah, that's correct, uh, Chair. Uh, uh, Councillor Roper did uh, uh, think this might happen. So um, I've got a copy of his statement, uh, which I'll, I will read on, on, both our, uh, on both our parts. Thank you very much. And just for the benefit of the public and the benefit of uh, those listening, uh, Councillor Watson uh, and, and Councillor Roper are both local councillors for the Rittle uh, area. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So we, like the Parish Council, have accepted the need for the housing, but wish to ensure that the development enhances the area. The work of the Rittle Neighbourhood Plan will be considered fully and included. There are three vice First is the traffic improvements to Lordship Road that um, uh, Councillor Hibbett referred to earlier. Riddle has, a much, uh, has much through traffic and Lordship Road is a serious problem with access to an industrial unit dealing with heavy farm machinery, access to Riddle University College, including all its students, the doctor's surgery and a busy garage and filling station. And yet, as I think uh, Councillor Hibbett mentioned, another serious accident occurred outside the surgery um, in the last couple of weeks which demonstrates the necessity of this work to be carried out before um, any uh, substantial increase in traffic is seen. A study has already been undertaken by the Parish Council, Riddle University College and Essex Highways and is outlined in paragraph 1.18, local improvements in the statement of common ground with Chelmsford site promoters and Essex County Council, highways and transportation. There seems to be some doubt as to whether the NH NHS Trust will take up the site they have been allocated on Warren Farm, and if they don't, there will be tremendous additional pressure on the existing surgery, exacerbating the problems. These improvements are essential, and whilst they may be dealt with at the planning application stage by conditions, they should also be mentioned now in the master plan. Second is the bus service. With the council aim, aiming for greener travel and a reduction in car usage, the proposals have been in the plans from the start, and we believe on the insistence of, of Essex County Council Highways and Transportation Department must include the link allowing the bus company to expand its service to the Chicken Estate to include Warren Farm. Whilst improvements have been made to the Roxburgh Road Chicken Road junctions in normal times, traffic queues in the morning and afternoon in, on the Roxburgh Road back from the junction to Lordship Road are a serious impediment for several hours a day for people travelling in and out of the city and to Bruce Hospital. Another of the county highway's conditions is that the bus loop within the site should be operational prior to the, op the op occupation of the 1200, sorry, of the 100th dwelling. This presumably would dealt with, dealt with by the condition of the planning application phase, but is also essential to this scheme. Finally, the travelling show person people site. We understand that after serious concerns raised by the Showman's Guild, the access road from the A10 being reassessed. We ask why this access cannot be from the junction of, of, the, of the new roundabout, um, as the busy uh, as the A160 is a busy road, and we don't see the uh, necessity for an extra junction just metres away from the uh, proposed layout. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Yes, thank you, Councillor, and um, and uh, uh, we will look forward to hearing Councillor Roper at future meetings on other subjects. But thank you for stepping in and doing that. Uh, uh, and thank you all again for the detail with which you have looked at various aspects of, of the plan. Uh, it is a learning process for us all as to how to make the best use of this process because we are absolutely committed to make the best possible 
and, and which we are looking to address, help address the housing crisis with, alongside <clears throat> environmental improvements and so on. I'm going to ask Councillor McCrory whether he'd like to comment at this stage or not. And I'm going to say to Councillor Dayton, please remember what I was saying earlier on, that I'm not coming back to the policy board members themselves until after the officers have responded to some of the public questions. So my question at the moment is to Councillor McCrory as to whether, uh, as Cabinet member, he wants to come in at this stage or later. I, I really just wanted to listen to the debate, Chairman. Thank you and listen to everybody's views. OK, that's great. Thank you very much indeed. In which case, I'm going to uh, hand this back to uh, officers and and ask them, first of all, the city council on to some of those points and at the appropriate point for them to introduce the county council officers. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> um, if it's OK with you, Chair, I'll propose that um, I'll deal with each in chronological order as we heard them. Um, I'm, I'm Jeremy Potter and specifically Hilary Gore from County Council who, who is on the meeting as well. Um, just on um, the CIRA um, comments that we heard earlier, I just want to pick up some of the planning points myself and then I may well bring in Jeremy and then Hilary to deal with Highway's comments because there were some specifics that that um, just want to, just want to make some some general point. Be noted in the um, representations. Obviously, I've read through those. I think it's a case that um, these these are these are valid planning concerns. However, we're not we're not dealing with the detail as we would do with a plan application here. And I think that's worth um, reiterating on those points. Obviously, they are valid concerns. Um, they're valid planning matters. However, these matters, uh, well, firstly, there is not the detail within the master plan to fully consider each one of those points. So the question to officers and obviously to policy board in my mind is, 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 is all the, is all these matters of specific concern now um, in our view um, there is there are mitigation measures which are not fully revealed at this point and won't be fully revealed until we receive an environmental statement to accompany a plan application so in some respects I acknowledge the points um, however I would say that whilst they whilst there are concerns that this is a matter a detailed matter for plan application stage so that's the that's Pumping points. In terms of, I think there was a comment regarding growth beyond uh, West Chelmsford westwards. I think that obviously we're dealing with with what's in front of us in terms of local plan at the moment. So I think any speculation what may happen in, in future plans is, is slightly premature. And I think we, we just need to deal with what's in front of us at the moment for this allocation around 800 homes uh, with the accompanying infrastructure. So that's the only point I would make in terms of. Um, going forward, I know that some public representations did make comment on things such as a Western Relief Road, um, park and ride, but obviously those matters are not are not before us at the moment. Just on the specific um, highways points, um, I noticed specific comments on safety, expected footfall, um, pinch points, and and specifically the spatial standards, and also the road safety audit. Um, I would just like to note before I introduce um, Hilary Gore on the road safety audit point is that that information has been provided um, by officers because it is part of the background information that supports master plan and will support the plan application going forward. However, that information is not is not part of the master plan. So in, in some respects, policy board are, are reliant on the advice of officers and, and in particular Hilary Gore on these points. Obviously, they have been explored further by by CIRA and obviously um, we're happy to take um, those queries and um, the green sheet um, to deal with some of those. So um, I'd like to introduce Hilary to just discuss the highways matters if I may, Hilary. Thank you, Matthew. Um, I'll go through the points in turn that CIRA have raised. Uh, first of all, they raised the compliance with standards. Um, the proposed bus link does comply with minimum standards. Um, there are various um, documents, including manifest streets and estate design, the Essex design guide, which set out what the standards should be. 
Um, and um, as, as stated, um, the preferred minimum width is two metres. However, you can reduce down to 1.5 metres and the absolute minimum is one metre. The proposal here is, is to go down to 1.2 metre, which is actually um, satisfactory width to accommodate um, two people walking side by side. It's also, also sat, um, satisfactory to accommodate um, a visually impaired person or a um, a visually impaired person who's got a guide dog. So um, it can accommodate um, sufficiently um, the expected um, level of traffic, uh, pedestrian traffic um, used to, um, along this link. Um, so it's not contrary to standards. With regard to the um, road safety audit, uh, the point was made about the swept paths uh, for the buses. Um, the swept paths of the likely expected bus routes have been undertaken um, and the expected bus route is down um, from the Avon um, Road bus link to Trent Road um, and the expected route will then go on to Melbourne and Langton Avenue and then into the city centre. Um, so that is the route which we expect the bus to take. We've taken advice from our passenger transport colleagues. Um, the existing bus service along Avon Road uh, will continue, so it will complement that. Um, but um, at the detailed design stage, should the uh, proposed bus route change, we would ask the developers to um, look at additional swept path movements um, to ensure that they can be accommodated. Uh, there, there is space within Avon Road um, particularly because there is the grassed area in the middle. Um, so um, we, we think that, that that could be accommodated should it be necessary, but the developer will have to do more work to show that they can be accommodated and the improvements uh, provided necessary to uh, make those achievable. Um, parking restrictions can be applied within the central area to ensure that there's no parking uh, within the um, stop lines for the signals, which, which we wouldn't we want anyway, because that, that would be unsafe. Um, so traffic regulation orders could control that. So parking within that area wouldn't be a, wouldn't be a problem. Um, in terms of uh, the next point, uh, which was walking um, between the school and the, um, sorry, I missed out one point. One, the point was um, about um, the, the road safety audit um, uh, issues not having been addressed. Uh, it's very unusual for a developer to go into such detail in terms of design at the, the master plan stage. Um, but we um, obviously um, had to ensure that the bus link was acceptable from a highways um, safety point of view in principle. Um, so we've asked uh, the developers to undertake quite a lot of detailed work at this stage. And um, a road safety audit has been undertaken. There were a few outstanding issues. Um, but we were satisfied that these can be dealt at the de dealt with at the detailed design stage. There are a few issues that, that need to be looked at in more detail, like pedestrian crossing points. However, we, we've discussed this with, with um, our road safety engineers internally and our traffic management colleagues and our um, traffic signal colleagues. And we are satisfied that those issues can be overcome and could be designed out at the detailed design stage. Um, the next point was the walking between the school and the park. Um, as I said previously, the, um, the footway uh, is proposed to be 1.2 metres at its very minimum width, which is just where the bus link joins um, Avon Road. The vast majority of the route is two metres, narrowing down to a short section which it varies between 1.8 and 1.5 metres. And as I said before, um, 1.2 is satisfactory to accommodate two people walking side by side. 1.5 uh, metres, you can get a wheelchair um, with a person walking alongside. Um, we are expecting the, the route to be used by pedestrians. Yes, of course, because it will be a link between the two, two development, the, the Avon Road um, Chignall Estate and um, the new development. Uh, we are expecting the route to be used by cyclists. Um, and the cyclists are expected to cycle on carriageway. The um, footway will not be used by um, cyclists. Um, the bus link um, is proposed to be used um, 
probably it will be used every 20 minutes by a bus in each direction, maybe once every 15 minutes as, as the site progresses and the bus service becomes more, more popular. And therefore, there'll be lots of capacity for cyclists to cycle on the actual carriageway. And they too will be controlled by traffic signals um, so that that would be a safe manoeuvre for them to, to carry out. Um, so we would be satisfied that the uh, pedestrian and cycle facilities would be adequate for the loose usage proposed, um, including if there were to be trips from the school um, to the park um, in the new development. Um, I think that was all. If there's any other highway questions, please let me know that I haven't, that I haven't answered from Sierra. Thank you, Hilary, and thank you very much for, for joining joining us at this meeting. I think the, the highway's involvement in all of these processes and various master plans in various parts of the city <clears throat> is absolutely crucial. And obviously, in this particular case, has been uh, the, the, the biggest subject which is going to be debated now, I suspect. <clears throat> I just wanted to point out that somebody still has their hand up, not in the chat column, but in the uh, in, in the, the things that one can do with Teams meetings. So if you could just lower that hand, I'd appreciate it. Uh, I don't know whether, Carrie, whether I want to take at this moment to go back to Barry Knight, who had his hand up at some stage earlier on, but, but we couldn't hear him earlier, whether he wanted to say something that was appropriate at this particular point or had, should have been said before. Barry, are you there with us now? Oh, maybe he's lowered his hand. <clears throat> so there we go. Uh, OK, so what I would like, what I would intend to do then is to invite the policy board members to debate the various, uh, make comments and debate the various aspects that have been raised so far. We've heard that there are elements of this master plan which officers and Crest uh, do recognise are there to be further negotiated, further improved and in many respects are detail which can be addressed in the environmental impact study and in the planning application stage. So our job here in the policy board is really to try to make sure uh, where are the issues of principle that we would want to question uh, and are they of sufficient uh, importance in principle to, uh, to change the master plan at this particular junction or encourage work on it before it reaches cabinet. I see that Mr Potter from the planning department has his hand up. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I was just checking whether um, we wanted, obviously we've responded or Matthew's responded to that first um, question from from uh, um, Sierra. I just wonder whether you would um, uh, yourself would want us to just go through the other questions and our responses to those before we start that more uh, substantive debate. Um, thank you, Chair. Sorry, um, Chair, you're you're more, you're on mute. So yes, in, yes, indeed. I I don't mean to be anything other than balanced in this. I apologise if some of the points have been missed. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so I think Matthew, if you're, um, I think Matthew Perry will just go through the rest of those um, and then bring in um, Hilary Gore when needed, and then we're just, uh, um, I might just do a sum up if that's okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, happy for you to overlay. Um, at the end. Um, in terms of um, Mr Wicklock's um, petition, um, in terms of the, the, the key elements, obviously the, the key um, kind of issue is in relation to um, the buffer uh, rural character um, along Roxhall Road. Obviously what, what you see in the master plan um, is something in the region of, of 30 metres um, in terms of a buffer which includes earth, earth mounding and landscaping. Um, that, that's set back from Roxhall Road. So we have a, a debate um, really to be had possibly amongst policy board, but certainly uh, I'm happy to have with myself in terms of that debate 30 metres versus 90 up to 120 as, as we um, reach out to the western edge. Um, Mr Whitlock, um, noted that, that the separation didn't appear to have changed, which um, I, I would acknowledge to, um, to 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 a major degree. Um, this 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 is this is an area which I think the officers don't necessarily agree with um, Mr Whitlock and I think that we do need to be mindful of a balance here. Um, and he did allude to some of those points which I just wanted to come come to. Um, I think officers felt that the, the distance was slightly 
arbitrary, um, not specifically related to um, its topography, although we, we acknowledge the sentiment in terms of a, a separation from Roxhall Road. I think I also wanted to point out that um, we have as we are we have as officers um, consulted with um, parish council, met recently um, with them, and their representation, um, in my mind, um, acknowledges the 30 metres to be to be roughly um, roughly acceptable, subject to a few. Um, tweaks that they've noted within their representation. So I think we do have a slight discord between um, Parish Council and um, Mr Whitlock's petition, which um, ultimately it, it comes down to planners to be kind of the, the uh, arbit arbiter in this um, discussion. And I think it's the case that we as officers are comfortable where the, um, where the setback is at so roughly 30 metres subject to further design. I think it's the case that um, Mr Willock alluded to the point regarding highways in terms of speed reduction, which um, we are hoping, we're anticipating will happen as part of the infrastructure works. Um, and part of our, our justification in not setting back so far is that um, certainly feedback from highways is that in order to gain uh, police support and um, support through County Council for that speed reduction, you do need some type of visibility of built form along this frontage and I think it's worth noting that um, albeit the site is within the parish, parish of Rittle, um, the urban area does become extended to to take into account this site so what we're dealing with is is a new urban location on, on the edge of um, the city so I think that there is a balance and I think that you know, we could look to increase that buffer. Obviously, policy board are, are free to debate that. I think my concern is that in doing so, given where the numbers are within within the rest of the site, that my concern would be that density and potentially building height increase uh, within the remainder of the site. So um, that that is a kind of a secondary um, concern with with squeezing um, the developable area further further north away from Roxhall Road. But happy to have that. Happy to have this debate um, further. In terms of housing densities and, and housing uh, building heights, um, I think I think in my view there's there, well certainly on housing densities, um, I would acknowledge that officers do did have some comment regarding further considerations, and that that is one of the bullets within the report that uh, we weren't quite happy with some elements certainly in the northern uh, in the northern half of the development, particularly around Centenary Way public footpath and to the north side um, around the secondary um, route that travels northwards. I think it's a case that, um, again, the, the tweaks um, in my mind from the previous master plan, obviously we're dealing with the current version, that previous one is, is now cancelled, is that officers weren't overly concerned with, with where those densities um, they're still relatively low in, in our view, where those densities are ending up, and certainly on the on the building heights. I think that even the previous plan, um, I think there's some criticism over over two versus up to two and a half stories. Um, I think that up to two and a half stories does give some flexibility to the developer to increase height in certain locations. I think that certainly the the density and the height plan has changed a little bit, but along the predominant area along Roxhall Road, um, it is still shown as low density, um, up to two and a half storeys, um, and, and officers feel that, that that is acceptable. So I think that it's a case that we don't necessarily agree with um, the criticisms from, from Mr Willick, but happy to debate that also, just noting um, recommendations uh, within the officer report. Um, just going on to, um, Mr Hibbert's comments in terms of Rittle Parish Council. Um, obviously, traffic is acknowledged and further work needs to be done in terms of the plan application. But obviously, we do have a, an allocated site here now. In terms of the Lordship Road um, comment, um, obviously, we, we've worked with Crest and the Parish Council um, over, over the last few years to, to um, seek those those works as part of what will be part of a section 106 legal agreement package uh, following our recent meetings with um, the parish council um, crest have committed to include um, some wording to that effect to give comfort to um, 
uh, Ritter Parish Council on that point. So you know, that will be dealt with in, in, in a further in a further revision of, the, of those points. In terms of the, in terms of the bus link, obviously um, note and the parish council support for that. In terms of phasing, I think that phasing is, is something that, that we, we have acknowledged and has obviously come out within the Essex County Council High's recommendations that you know we are seeking um, further um, further revisions on phasing because we acknowledge that um, the bus link coming forward in phase two um, is not is not where we want to be and I think Hillary would, would echo that comment and I think that phasing we acknowledge uh, requires um, further work on, on Crest's behalf and that is a recommendation that I hope that policy board can, can give back to officers on, on that point. Um, Hillary, was there, any, was there anything Hillary you wish to comment on uh, Ritter Parish Council at this point and then I'll move on to um, Councillor Robinson and Councillor Watson beyond that. There was the Ritter Parish Council point on the travelling show person's access but that was not Chris Hibbert's, that was the, par the Parish Council wasn't it? Would you like me to deal with that now? Uh, yes please. Sir. Um, with regard to the um, separate travelling show person's access uh, which is a concern of Ritual Parish Council. Um, in the initial discussions with um, Crest, um, that the County Council did ask that um, it could be combined with an access from the roundabout in, within the site. That was examined in quite a lot of detail and there are difficulties with that in respect of the very large vehicles that the travelling show people use. Um, they um, have a lot of fairground equipment which need to be transported um, via large lorries and on trailers um, and quite often they um, they leave and enter the site in um, unsociable hours so very early in the morning to go off to the fairs and um, quite late at night after they've been away for some period. Um, therefore the travelling show person site can't um, be with it within the body of the residential area because um, it would be too much disruption for for the new residents and it would have to be adjacent to Roxwell Road uh, which in itself creates a difficulty um, to be accessed by, via one of the roundabouts. It would either need the roundabout um, to be five arms which is is not considered really to be a safe option and the new design um, manual for road and bridge works um, does advise against five arm roundabouts, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and if it was via a four arm roundabout with an access further into the site, it would have to be quite a long way from the roundabout to um, enable safe manoeuvres. So um, the access would have to go back on itself and it would have to be extremely large to accommodate the turning manoeuvres by these very, very large vehicles. Um, so there are a lot of technical reasons why um, the access is much, much better to be separate on Roxwell Road frontage itself. Um, we have um, asked Crest to do quite a lot of design work to show what access um, would be necessary uh, to accommodate these large vehicles. And the design um, had been accompanied by a road safety audit, which showed that the um, separate access is acceptable in principle, both in terms of capacity and safety. Um, and therefore the Highway Authority is satisfied that a separate access um, would be <coughs> the appropriate um, solution in this instance. Thank you, Hilary. Um, I believe that also touched upon um, Councillor Watson's point regarding TSP access. Um, just one thing I would like to comment on in that respect is that we have received today um, a representation from representative of the Showman's Guild um, that has received quite quite late on today. Um, I did actually meet with them earlier today also. Um, so they, they have um, outlined some concern with the safety of, of that access. However, uh, we've just heard from Hilary Gore on, on that point. Um, the Showman's Guild um, haven't haven't specified in terms of detail um, any any evidence in terms of safety. So I think it's a case of um, highways believe there's a there's a workable solution in terms of in terms of that location. Obviously, um, residents don't necessarily agree, and we've had numerous representations on that point, both in terms of highway safety and residential amenity. And it, and it is one of the points that I uh, anticipate Policy Board uh, will seek to. Um, debate, but I think as far as 
um, city and Essex County Council are concerned that it is a workable solution. It does have it does have benefits in terms of um, the ability to get into the site and out of the site, and also um, neatly fits within within a corner of of the allocation that allows um, screening both for residents opposite um, and for the eventual occupiers themselves. So that's just um, I'm just going on to um, shifting around on on the show person's site on that point. I just want to come back to Kent of Robinson's. Again, some of those um, comments relate to um, Hillary's points on highway safety, which I'll, I'll ask Hillary to, Hillary to come back in on. But I just want to pick up some of the, um, the kind of development management um, issues raised by Councillor Robinson in terms of living conditions. I've already spoke about that in terms of my comments on the CIRA comment in terms of we acknowledge um, there are issues, there are issues to overcome, uh, but the detail is, is simply not known on some of these points and therefore the mitigation is simply um, not known. Um, they're not, not unusual in terms of um, impact upon residents, pollution, impact upon on, on parking and so forth. So you know, you know, these, these are things that we're used to dealing with as part of a detailed plan application. I did just want to um, touch upon some specifics um, in relation to, to parking on Avon Road, um, because some quite detailed comments, particularly within Sierra's um, objection paper uh, on the loss of parking on Avon Road, which um, it, which which is 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 necessary. Um, so the part the loss of parking, loss of full spaces is necessary on Avon Road um, to enable the stop line for the for the buses to go where it is proposed. Um, Cresta are currently showing an option to remove three street trees um, further north to um, reprovide those four spaces. Um, obviously, um, we we as officers. Um, acknowledge that um, that loss would be un unfortunate in terms of the street trees. So we did put the comment back to to see in terms of if those spaces didn't need to be reprovided or could be provided further afield, which I've asked Crest to look into, um, then um, we don't necessarily need to lose those trees. So I just want to make the point that the um, the bus link necessitates the loss of four parking spaces. Um, there is an implication on trees if 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 officers were to go along with Crest's um, option to reprovide those, but the busing doesn't necess necessitate the loss of of those street trees directly. I um, just want to make that point for for any further comment further on. In terms of in terms of visual impact, I think there's there's no doubt that um, the there will be a visual impact because um, this is an engineering operation. It requires a bridge across the brook. It requires um, embankments to raise that land level um, out of the flood zone and also to get the, the road um, to a suitable level to join into Avon Road further to the east. But I think that you know, we, are, we are dealing with a, a new allocation here that there will be some change. I think it's a case that, you know, those elements can be mitigated with with design um, in officers' view. I'll leave um, safety and uptake of buses to to um, Hillary. I just want to touch upon local plan policy. Um, D DC4 obviously um, we do have uh, new adopted policies in in the local plan, but um, you know they're they're essentially an echoing of of, of DC4 as referenced by Councillor Robinson. I think that. There is a difficulty with, with trying to specifically assess those points against such a development control policy, given that uh, we don't have all the detail in front of us at the moment. So we're dealing with um, almost the principle um, plus some detail in terms of where the bus link is at the moment. In terms of in terms of play area, um, obviously we acknowledge the requirement to upgrade that play area. There is already money set aside from another scheme to upgrade. Um, the Avon Road play area, which has obviously been um, postponed um, because uh, to deal with the outcome of of, of, of the Warren Farm allocation. Um, in terms of the current regarding plans needed now, I think 
um, there is a difficulty in kind of crystallising such plans at this early stage when we would perhaps expect that to be dealt with at, at even as far down as reserve matters stage. So I do acknowledge um, Councillor Robertson's point regarding that, but I think that the stage at which that, at which that happens, I wouldn't necessarily agree that it that it needs to be now. I think there is a commitment by Crest to um, add on to um, that sorry, add on to that, that money that is available to further improve the player over, over, over the money that's already allocated for that site. Um, in terms of connections um, to Highland School and, and further afield, I think that I'll direct members to um, one of the recommendations within the, within the officer report, which also refers to the Essex County Council Highways recommendation that um, we feel that a um, cycle network um, and pedestrian sorry, a cycle network pedestrian um, linkage use plan uh, would be a good addition to the master plan and that point would hopefully be picked up uh, within that type of revision. In terms of um, zero carbon um, initiatives, obviously the, the report is, is quite um, neutral on that. I understand that Council has had some concerns during the recent presentation uh, by Crest. Obviously, as DM officer, I'll come back to you know what's in our local plan and what what can policy board um, give us a give us a marker in terms of uh, what will hopefully be an adopted making places SPD further down the line, which gives a little bit more flesh um, to um, um, to that. So acknowledge um, acknowledge um, those those comments. Um, in terms of recommendation, obviously that that's sorry the additional recommendation that that's one to be. Um, debated uh, amongst the board shortly, I assume. So, could I just go back to Hillary on points of safety and uptake of bus buses, if I can? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Yes, on those two points, um, I think I've covered um, the safety issues in the zero response. Uh, but, but just to summarise, um, basically, the um, bus link is is not uh, below minimum standards. It does comply with standards, although there are reductions in widths for, for short distances. Um, the footways um, can accommodate um, pedestrians, even at the narrower section. It can accommodate um, two pedestrians walking side by side um, and it can safely accommodate um, cyclists and uh, buses and pedestrians all on that route. Um, the link won't be used by cars, it won't be used by taxis and it won't be used by motorcycles. It'll have restrictions on so it will be available for use by um, buses and cyclists only in terms of vehicles and um, also by pedestrians. Um, in terms of the, um, the bus um, take up, uh, we totally ag agree with Councillor Robinson that, that the principle of sustainable, sustainable transport is absolutely vital here. And uh, we feel that the, the bus link is one of those elements um, that is, is vital to um, make this uh, proposed development um, at East, uh, East uh, sorry, a Warren Farm um, sustainable. Um, it, it's um, essential to give uh, residents an, a real genuine choice of modes of travel um, and therefore um, we, we feel that, that it, it is a key link um, between the site and Avon Road to enable those um, bus routes to be um, allowed. Um, in terms of um, his point about um, the um, bus priority schemes alone not being um, not resulting in people using the buses, there will be a combination of incentives for um, the residents to, to use passenger transport, and those will include um, season tickets and other incentives so that um, the bus um, buses are taken up. Uh, we've had um, extreme success with the Bewley development in terms of um, encouraging people to travel by bus rather than their private car. And that's what we want to ensure happens at, at Warren Farm as well, is that people do have a genuine choice of alternative modes of travel from this development. Thank, Thank you. you. Is this where I hand back to Councillor Potter? I'm oh, sorry, to Councillor Potter, to Mr. Potter, just to capture the officer responses. If that's okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, so um, I, I think Matthew and Hilary have given um, the board quite a comprehensive response on some of those questions and statements that um, you've heard. Um, 
I just wanted to very briefly just sum up in relation to some of those in terms of the principle. Um, it's it's welcoming to hear, um, you know, the local plan sets that principle and we're talking about the detail of the master plan. And I think what board members will be facing is that kind of interface between master planning um, the local plan or the local plan, then master planning, then planning applications. And sometimes those interfaces between those three issues do overlap and do blur in certain circumstances to, to ensure that decision making can be made at the most appropriate uh, appropriate level. I just wanted to, to reiterate the fact that, I mean, the site was allocated in the local plan because of its potential sustainability credentials in terms of its um, proximity to local services and facilities by cycling and walking, <clears throat> excuse me, it, the opportunity for real integrated public transport that really um, um, penetrates into the site and creates more connections and more opportunities for, for public transport. And I think really um, that the bus link, the bus link has been established in the local plan, um, which was adopted on the 27th of May. And the inspector did consider the representations that um, opposed the link um, uh, as part of that process, albeit that it was the principle of the link, as members have, have, have identified, not necessarily the detail. Um, but what you have before you tonight is the Highways Authority um, saying to members that the evidence at this moment does show that in principle, the link can be delivered. It can be delivered and it can conform with standards um, and safety measures. Uh, further work is required to ensure that that link um, meets other uh, more detailed development management issues, as, as you heard from uh, um, Matthew Perry there. But in principle, um, there isn't anything to say that that can't um, be delivered. Um, the site, the road, as um, um, Hilary Gore was talking about, it isn't going to be a normal highway. Probably about 90% of the time it will have no vehicles on it whatsoever. It will be cycling, walking, um, all of those uh, more sustainable forms of transport. And then it will be controlled, um, light controlled um, when uh, the bus um, arrives. So I suppose it's just creating that connectivity and the permeability of um, the public transport that is really key. Um, and then also in terms of um, uh, the issues about the green space along Roxwell Road, I mean, obviously, green space and landscape is really important in the master plan. And I hope you'll see that that has been integrated into the master plan, not only to ensure that the development itself sits in the landscape, to also provide functional open space to new residents and existing residents ensure that we don't have strips of lands that aren't particularly useful, um, apart from obviously they provide some setting, but open space that's really functional and useful to residents um, existing and, and new. I'm going to leave it at their chair. I think you've um, heard those responses and um, I'll be over to you for, for your debate. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, <coughs> all of the officers, for responding that way. And again, thank you to the public <coughs> and to the other councillors who have participated. I need to say to Joanne Hawkins that I know she's had her hand up and our procedures don't allow for the uh, public to come back and, and join in the debate about a lot of the points that have been raised. But I would emphasise the points that officers have made, that this is a process which continues over time. <coughs> and whatever decision the board uh, may come to this evening, Evening, then the commitment that we have to continue the cooperation and the, the involvement with local residents, with the parish council and so on is, is there. And we don't see this as being the end of the process, but we are in a position where we need to understand <coughs> that we're recommending the principles involved. And if we can't, uh, to work out what, we, what we're going to recommend to deal with that lack of agreement. So I hope you understand that. And again, thank you for, for participating. <clears throat> so uh, at this point, I'm going to just draw everyone's attention to the fact that we're an hour and a half into the meeting. Uh, and I think that's in one sense understandable because this is probably the most contentious and most detailed item. And it is the first time that we have looked at a master plan in this context at this stage of its process. But I, I am open to the board's uh, views as to uh, until when we are prepared to continue sitting. I would prefer that we had to reconvene than that we should cut short debate on this or any other item. Uh, and I certainly will suggest a break at the end of this item, a comfort break at the end of this item before we move on from there. Uh, but, but at this stage, I don't know whether someone would like to suggest 
uh, a time limit at all. I mean, I certainly believe that we would be uh, ill-advised to go on beyond beyond 10.30, and I think we'd be ill-advised to go on beyond 10. That would be my suggestion. Yes, probably. If I could ask that to the members of the board, please, Stephen. Yeah, I was just hoping someone else. Agreed. Agreed. I go for 10 o'clock. Oh, yeah, tell it sounds logical to me too. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, and uh, and we'll 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 use that time to the best of our ability, and we won't we won't try to cut short debate on items uh, in order to get the maximum amount in by then. It will it will be what it will be, and we'll take it from there. So what I'd like to do is to go to <clears throat> members of the board in the first instance. Uh, to raise some some points or to to further the debate on particular aspects of this, uh, I, I'd like <clears throat> I'd like to try to take them sort of topic by topic. So it might be helpful if you on the chat board, if you if you said briefly if you can what aspect of this you want to discuss, but otherwise I will simply take people in the order that I that I see them, and I see Councillor Goldman. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, yeah, I, sorry, I should have put Busgate um, in my first H that I put up in the chat box. Um, but I would just, I would like to talk about the, the Busgate proposals. I, um, I have a question actually for um, uh, Hilary Gore. I, I think I heard her say that there would be um, a, something like a bus every 15 minutes, which obviously works out to about four every hour. Um, but I'm, I've been informed by a colleague that um, I think some of the other paperwork says that it will actually be eight an hour. So I was wondering if that discrepancy could be um, clarified. Um, I was also um, surprised, perhaps, um, to hear that the casual referral um, by Hillary to the possible loss of some of the, gre the grassed area opposite the um, where the bus gate would exit onto is it Avon Road. Um, it, it sounded like oh, well, there's some green space we can take up there if the buses need it. That seemed, seemed a little bit too casual for me, and I'd, I'd, I'd quite like to understand how much is a little bit of green space that might need to be used when I, I thought we were saying that the the, we, the investigation had been done to make sure that the buses could turn there and 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 uh, and, and move around as, as needed. But uh, maybe that could be clarified as well. Um, and then I would like to say that um, I'm really actually very disappointed by... Um, by the busgate proposals, um, the, it, it just feels a lot to me as though it's, oh, look, there's a gap between two houses, let's shove a bus through there, it, rather than thinking what what is sustainable transport really about. Um, maybe I've missed it somewhere and you'd have to forgive me. I, I don't understand why the buses have to come out through that way at all. Um, I don't understand actually why they can't come out of the um, the main entrance into the development and then uh, and divert other ways. I don't really understand what what the massive benefit would be if there is one at all um, to coming out through through that gap um, and, and the loss of of uh, wildlife and the and that what I, looks to me a really awful design of raising a bridge. Um, it just doesn't fit in with anything at all. And I I have to say that that is one of the most disappointing things about this plan. It just it just doesn't seem to be um, sympathetic at all um, and, and just. Yeah, I have real concerns about it, but I would like, I was wondering if she, if she could provide answers to those those questions. Thanks. Yeah, I'm going to take several comments all at once before I go back to officers for clarification, but I'm sure Hilary have just made a note of those questions and we'll come back to you. I have Councillor Knight with his hand up. No, we still don't have Councillor Knight. His hand does keep appearing, so I'm a bit confused by that. Uh, so I have Councillor Sosin. Can you hear me now? Who's that? This is Barry Knight. Yes, I can now, Barry, oh, yes. Thanks. I'm sorry, I'm having the same problems uh, that, that other people have been having. I'm a little bit bemused, Mr Chairman. The, Liber the Liberal administration continually tells us that it wants to work with local residents. And you yourself this evening have said that this isn't the end of the process. We're going to continue talking to them. And yet you've heard from the St Andrews residents who've, who are almost universally against it. 
and the Rittle Parish Council chairman has, and um, the other gentleman has already told you that Rittle is almost universally against it, and yet we're still talking about it going on. So I'm bemused. Help me. Uh, is that a question about the the inclusion of the site at all, or is that a question about the sustainable transport? It was a question about the the, the proposed development in in its totality. In which case, if I may, I'm going to repeat what I said earlier on, uh, <clears throat> and the officer will correct me if I'm wrong. That this this site was part of the proposals of the previous administration that went to the public inquiry about the potential adoption of the local plan. And it went through a process that was not just about this particular site, but about the overall <clears throat> manner in which the plan was going to meet our overall housing obligations. And each site was examined in terms of its deliverability and its appropriateness to the underlying principles that were in the plan that your group uh, proposed. <clears throat> now, we underlined the fact when we came into power <clears throat> that, <clears throat> that we applauded the work that the officers had done in that respect, that we recognised and, uh, and, uh, and acknowledged that much of the wording within that plan uh, was in line with the principles that all of us, party political politics aside, would want to see involved in uh, in the development of various sites as we meet our housing obligations and at the same time meet the uh, the quality of life for new residents and the sustainability trend principles more generally. And we were at pains to establish that there was sufficient flexibility to enable us to look at each site site by site to optimise the way in which those goals were met. So I could, Barry, if I chose, simply rule that out of order, but I do you the courtesy of reiterating that process, that it's in the local plan, that to remove it from the local plan would risk and indeed risk the almost certainty of the plan then becoming unsound in the eye of the in the eyes of the inspector, and we will be back to square one in being term, in terms of being open to planning applications for this and other sites anyway being open to criticisms uh, 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 for all of the reasons that both parties understand that we need a plan in place in order to best fulfil all of these obligations. So I don't want to go on too much longer about this, and I'm grateful to the Rittle residents and the Parish Council for acknowledging as they have the fact that this site is in, not up for debate in that sense, although the principles of it, the principles of the, the aspects of it, uh, are here for us to agree. <clears throat> And I, I don't think I want to go further than that. I would ask uh, Mr. Potter just to respond a little bit as well on this specific point. Um, yes, thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair. I mean, um, you're absolutely right. I mean, the local plan has been adopted. It is the statutory local plan for this area from um, adopted on the 27th of May. It includes that allocation as a, a residential allocation. Um, and I mean, that is the factor of the matter, um, what we're talking about tonight. And also what has been the vast debate, the discourse is about the detail about how we place shape, how we connect, how we um, ensure that that development is of hard, the highest quality and, and the most sustainable. It isn't about the principle, I'm afraid, which has already been established. Thank you, Chair. I would like to point out that the that the adoption of the local plan with uh, two dissenting voices from amongst the independent group was unanimously approved by the council as a whole. So I, I, I know your point of view, Barry, and I respect that you have the right to that point of view, but it really is not something that can be taken into consideration, certainly not in this meeting, and I don't quite know how else, to be perfectly honest. <clears throat> So you, know, you have your hand up, so if you want to come back, please do. But please do recognise that this is not part of the debate that we're meant to be having this evening. OK, you put your hand out, you put your hand down. So, <clears throat> so I want to continue the, the debate about uh, the uh, about the, the, the sustainability aspects of both uh, both for and against the bus gate, but also in the context of Roxwell Rose itself because I think that this is throwing up, uh, the debate so far has thrown up uh, questions about the completeness of the investigations, which have been done in both respects, uh, in both respects of Avon Road and in respect of Roxwell Road. 
So I have Councillor Sochin next. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And I recognise that the um, developers have spent um, a, a long time, and particularly over the last two years, to um, bring forward their proposals that they've reached now. The various um, groups of residents of uh, Rittle Parish Council uh, and um, uh, various other people have put a, a substantial amount of work in bringing forward representations tonight. And to move this debate forward, I'd like to move a motion um, uh, to uh, bring forward a conclusion along the lines that um, Councillor Robinson suggested a little bit earlier. And I will read the motion. I'll divide it up into three sentences rather than one long sentence. Uh, the policy board accepts there are significant doubts about the safety, viability and benefits of the bus link. It therefore refers all the sustainable transport elements for this development to officers. It agrees, if necessary, to convene a special meeting of the board to review the master plan before cabinet. Now, the, the reason for this motion, and I think uh, I have a, a fellow councillor who second that, um, there are in the officers reports various places where they recommend uh, there should be changes. And this combined to me suggests that it's not in the state to go to the cabinet yet. 3.12 3 is the bus link. And I think um, my fellow council will speak more to that. I could just recall a long time ago taking children to school, perhaps 10 abreast, two prams, uh, a double bucky, um, scooters, people with balls. I imagine them going through this narrow link. Um, uh, and I don't know how it counts. Um, uh, powered um, wheelchairs. Uh, my neighbour now has a bike with a uh, powered bike and all these type of issues. But I'll, I'll leave uh, my colleague to address that in more the thing. But there are other, other things. 3.14, it talks about the curvature of the secondary road. Uh, they feel that some work ought to be done on that. 3.15, the uh, um, right of way and the pedestrian cycle route some comments about that. 319, uh, there was one stage, another pedestrian cycle route link into Avon Road from lower, from further south in the site. And there's all the Essex County Council highways consultation responses. And as well as that, there's another, as the officer, Mr. Uh, Mr. Percy, was talking about, is the in the northern block, there is the uh, density division. So I think there's room for some further work. Uh, I know the uh, developer's been working very hard over a number of years, and that's why I'd like to put this motion forward. And I hope uh, I see Councillor uh, uh, Rose uh, is uh, ready to second that, I hope. Thank you, Councillor Sozin. Yes, I'm very happy to second this proposal of the amendment. The expectation from the outset of master planning and throughout master planning phase is that public concerns and ideas will be taken into account with suggestions of alternatives to contentious proposals such as the bus gate in this situation properly considered. This doesn't appear to be a reality. Expectations have not been met. Members of the Chignall Estate Residents Association should be able to focus on positives by now, and they have demonstrated their wish to do that. They want to help shape the long awaited park improvements and play facilities in the area. They want to be involved in tree selection, sourcing and community planting in the new developments and be involved in the creation of the eco park and other natural green spaces. They wish to contribute, look to the future and actively gauge, engage with the new community at Warren Farm and to demonstrate true neighbourliness. Instead, they are faced with a seemingly immovable obstacle right from the outset. This small parcel of land between the existing and the new communities is exactly the kind of natural green space that we pledge to protect, enhance and preserve in our local plan. Open space is fundamental to our health and well-being, as referenced in the Council's recently published Health and Wellbeing Plan and our Chelmsford Our Plan, which outlines the City Council's corporate strategy. Several years before being elected to serve as a councillor, 
Um, I registered as a consultee and engaged in the consultation process for Chelmsford's local plan 2016 to 36. I was particularly interested to read the Open Space, Sports and Recreational Facilities Study as part of the community and stakeholder consultation. This document affirms the need for natural open spaces within communities and the importance of natural open space within walking distance of so many residents, so relevant both to the existing Avon Road community and the new developments. This represents a mature and well-established area of habitat and is of great importance to the local community. And as Councillor Goldman put it so eloquently, the idea that the infrastructure should sever this and and just really destroy a habitat and, in, and endanger existing wildlife, not to mention the health and well-being of residents, it just appears to be unacceptable. I object most strongly to any loss of habitat or biodiversity, um, including the unfortunate loss of street trees. This runs against the City Council's declaration of climate and ecological emergency in 2019 and County Council's recognition of the importance of biodiversity to a sustainable future and achieving net zero carbon. Mitigation is a term too often thrown out there, really facilitating the destruction of habitat, which is seen to be in the wrong place. I would question here, is it the habitat that's in the wrong place or the bus gate? I visited the proposed location of the bus gate and the area of established habitat around the brook, which gives a much better overview of the issues around the route of the bus gate. It is vital that members of planning committee take part in a site visit before they consider the application. I remain deeply concerned about the severance of habitat, health impacts on residents adjacent to the planned road and risks to pedestrians and cyclists taking the same route despite the reinsurances from Ms. Gore. The detrimental impact on the natural environment here, a well-established woodland habitat around a low-lying brook, which is prone to seasonal flooding, and the painful impact on the lives of those whose homes are adjacent to the proposed link must be considered at this stage of the process. Chignell Estate residents want to be acknowledged and it is their right to be acknowledged. They have engaged with ward councillors and Cress Nicholson from the outset, voicing concerns about the proposed bus link, the brutal severance of natural green space, the resultant destruction of habitat, tangible road safety issues, pollution, noise and light disturbance. Still, despite their evidence and well-argued case against this, the bus link proposal in this location remains the elephant in the room. It is the duty of councillors to engage with, listen and empathise with our res residents as it is the duty of officers to respond accordingly to concerns, to seek alternatives and, we hope, achieve a resolution. And it, I remind members that it is the principle of the link, not the reality of this link, that we would seek to, on clarification on. So I would wholeheartedly recommend that the board supports the amendment this evening. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Councillor Moore. I have Councillor Gulliver, and then I'll come back in again to, to on the procedure as to how we deal with this amendment. Thank you, Councillor Pooley. You and I have been debating this site for many years, and I can remember when you were expounding the sustainabilities of this site many years ago. And I've sub subsequently picked up on the points that you made, which is why the Conservative group then followed on from what the Lib Dems said about Warren Farm being a sustainable site for development. It is. And I would certainly say that one of the strong cases that making this site sustainable is about having the correct bus link to get residents from this area to the railway station without having to revert to motor vehicles and cars making extra journeys when partners are returning to pick up their other halves has got to be ruled out completely. So the proper bus link is absolutely necessary. As to how this is, is achieved, 
after all the years that I've been looking at this site, I think there's a numerous ways that can be achieved, but whether it's taken in by this strip of land, it will take the bus link away from use of the local residents. But I would think that if they want to do away with the bus service, they are welcome to do so. But the main thing is that we have a proper bus service that links the roads. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Assuming that we're still on uh, discussing the desirability of some further work to be done on sustainable transport rather than on other aspects of it, I have Councillor Goldman and then I have Councillor Roberts. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I, um, I, I do think obviously sustainability is uh, is absolutely crucial, and um, I know that one of the Liberal Democrats' objections to um, to the local plan um, was that um, it required develop. Well, developers were supposed to uh, on uh, um, what was the wording looking for um, preferring to focus on um, sustainability rather than requiring them to do so. So um, we would obviously prefer developers to be required to focus on sustainability but hey we are where we are with with kind of the local plan um and on that subject i would just like to correct the record and i wouldn't normally bother doing this because i don't think that um normally this is something that we should really get into in these sort of uh, debates um but um seeing as there are some members of the public here today i would just like to set the record straight the um the local plan um was sent was um it, the the council full council um resolved to send the local plan for um to submit it to the um uh, uh to the inspector um at a meeting of the full council on the, on the 19th of june 2018 and i'm extremely surprised and a little bit frustrated to be honest um by uh, councillor knight's um contribution earlier when he was um saying that that and i know that when he was saying that the liberal democrats um you know should just essentially pull this from the local plan and i know that councillor pooley did reiterate that it isn't possible to pull it from the local plan but i would also like to draw attention to the fact that councillor knight was present according to the record um uh, at that meeting on the 19th of june 2018 which was the last possible opportunity for that to have been properly pulled from from the plan um, and as, as far as I can tell from the records, Councillor Knight was among the, the group that voted for the, um, that submission of the local plan and the Liberal Democrats are on record as voting against it. So I just wanted to set that record straight because I, I'm not sure that um, that it was made completely clear by, by Councillor Knight that he did actually vote for that in 2018. Um, and uh, and in, as term, in, in terms of the in terms of the motion that has been put forward by um, by Councillor Soshin, I would also add, like to add my my uh, voice to um, supporting that. <coughs> I have Councillor Roberts, and then I have Councillor Poulter, I think, and Council then Councillor Whitehead. Ah, oh, good evening, everybody. Um, uh, when I looked at the plan, and I must say, looking at the plan on a, on a small computer screen does leave a lot to be desired, and I, I, I do really like to see nice big A3 ones that I can actually understand. And my logic says that the uh, bus uh, link is not in the correct position. It doesn't. It doesn't look right. It doesn't fit right. The bus route, looking at the plan on my other little computer, is ideal, in my view, from the roundabout to roundabout. It goes through the site and think so i believe that the, this motion is one that uh, we will be supporting in in the grounds to have it um, looked at in more detail thank you thank you councillor poulter thank you chairman um i've missed some of the debate because i've had a couple of power cuts so unfortunately, I missed the comments of um, Councillor Knight. Um, it seems likely that the proposal to adjourn this is going to succeed. But the point that I'd like to make is that if we're going to look again at highway issues, that those highway issues should include traffic management on Lordship Road and address the points that have been raised by Whittle residents, the Parish Council and Councillor Watson. 
<clears throat> Thank you, Councillor Poulter. Yes, you anticipate some of the summing up of this point, of this part of the debate that I would have done, but yes, you're absolutely right. Councillor Whitehead. Yes, thank you. Good evening, Chairman. Uh, we were starting to get political there, which I think we need to avoid because uh, that's not the purpose of this evening's meeting. The situation is that there are buses. The 54 bus, I think, runs along the, the north part of Avon Road anyway. Uh, and the situation around there is not one that I, as a faraway person, knows enough to talk positively about. So what I'd like to do really is agree um, with Councillor Sosin. The, the key point is, I'm sure there should be a bus access. I, I'm 100% certain there should be a bus access. How it is developed looks awful on the site. Uh, and looking at it on Google Maps and Earth and all the other things that one can do, none of it looks any better. It is a very narrow entrance. So I think it, it would be right for us to go back now and look again at how that access can be made or where it should be along that site. I mean, Avon Road is quite a lovely road in the sense it's got grass, as Councillor Moore was saying, and all sorts of things along there. But we have to accept that the plan is there. Uh, and uh, to go down the route of saying, well, let's not have a bus link would, would be foolish because it goes against everything that, that she and Councillor Robinson uh, want to do on, on sustainable transport, really. Uh, you can get a bus from there, in fact, up to Broomfield Hospital and so on, uh, rather than go all the way down along Roxford Road and all the way up the main road and so on. So so I think it is very important that, that we have a bus link. Um, looking at the timetable up there, I think the bus is on the 54 every 20 minutes or so. Um, and I think they, they sort of get rather less during the day. So it's not really, I think, a question of whether there should be a bus link or not, but I think it's vital that the bus link part of all this is looked at because narrow pathways uh, and so on are, are not what we want. Destroying lots of green land is not what we want to do either, really. But equally, we don't want loads and loads of cars driving around Chelmsford uh, and to be stopped from sort of being in the car and to get people on buses is a Liberal Democrat policy. The final, and, 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 and sorry, is a slightly political point, but that site was in the Lib Dem uh, original plans uh, in, in 2001. I never, never lose sight of, of this wonderful document uh, that I always bring um, to meetings. Uh, and uh, in the end, it is a very sustainable site along there. Uh, and, and I think that traffic along that road is, is bad. Uh, and I've driven along it. Traffic in Rittle is very, very difficult. But to make things worse in Rittle by doing away with the bus link would not be right. So I, I agree that we have to look, as Councillor Poulter just said, um, at Lordship Lane. Uh, we have to look at all of these points again uh, and therefore sending this to Cabinet in a few weeks' time uh, as it is. I know we're sort of inching into planning, but as it stands at the moment, I think that that would be a mistake uh, to do that. I think we need to postpone this while the bus link part and where it can be is looked at in great detail by members and, and brought back to this committee before it goes any further. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, <coughs> thank you, Councillor Whitehead. Uh, <coughs> I have Councillor Dayden and then Councillor Moore, and then I'm going to try to see if we can at least wrap up this particular part of this debate. Evening, Chair. Um, I'm going to ask a bit of a rookie question, I think, because um, I do support the motion. I think it, it, it's quite right. We have another look at it. But um, one of our options is the Essex Quality Review Panel. Um, and I just wondered, how does that work? Um, can we choose the panel members? How do they determine the quality and the design of things? Because um, sometimes fresh eyes have fresh ideas um, and they might have solutions to the bus link that hasn't been thought of. But um, that could be beneficial. So, um, and so we're quite right. We shouldn't be political about this. But two of our members did vote against the uh, the plan. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, let me just ask uh, Mr. Potter for an answer to that particular question. It's an aspect of the report that hasn't had a mention so far in detail. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much, Chair. Um, so the Essex Quality Review Panel, um, we uh, feel is a good 
um, sort of sounding board, new uh, check and balance, an independent check and balance that um, Councillor Dadin rightly said. Um, it isn't necessarily something um, to determine matters of principle, but I think um, what we would prefer to do is to get to a point where we have more consensus um, from members on on the shape of the principles in the master plan before we take it to um, that quality review panel. Um, but it is definitely something that and um, fresh pairs of eyes and an independent pair of eyes um, is you know could be actually very beneficial in regard to um, achieving some of those goals. Thank you. Could I could I just say it almost feels like it should go there before it comes to the policy board, so we have recommendations from them, but. I don't know if I've understood their job quite right, but. Sorry, Chair, with your agreement, oh. um, I can come back. Yes, yes, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, you're right. Um, and um, in terms of the master plans, these two master plans, they are running ahead of um, the other master plans. And I think the quality review panel for say for South Woodham, which is a master plan that's being evolved at the moment is coming in earlier. So you're absolutely right in that regard. Um, and we would have preferred to have got those in earlier, but um, we were waiting for, obviously for the local plan to be adopted to ensure that we can move forwards on that policy basis. So you're right, it should be earlier on in the process and it will be for further side. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think that underlines what I was saying earlier that that these first that these two plans uh, will benefit the the city if we can move them ahead to the next stage, uh, and we're still understanding as we're going along how the most master plan timetable fits in with other quality controls that we're having. So I certainly welcome uh, this this uh, innovation and this welcome, and they will have a view, I'm sure, about this aspect of it. So what I want to do with the boards, uh, well, first of all, I need to go back to Hilary Gore to see if she has, there was a question to her in particular at one point, uh, or whether that can whether that can wait for future discussions. But Hilary, I don't know whether you want to come back on one of Councillor Goldman's earlier points. Yes, thank you. Um, there was just a couple of points. Um, the first was about the frequency of the bus service. Um, the, the 15 minute bus service would be one in each direction, so it would be a total of eight. Um, our passenger transport colleagues have um, indicated that the likely level of service is actually one, one bus every 20 minutes, so that would um, be actually six buses per hour, um, but uh, it could possibly be up to a maximum of eight. Um, in terms of the auto tracks um, that would be required, um, there's every indication that the, the um, the bus would just go via Trent Road, which is the auto tracks or the swept path analysis, which has been undertaken already. And we're confident that that, that can be achieved uh, within the confines of Avon Road and um, that the proposed bus link, um, as shown on the um, information that Crest has, has provided, um, it's it's unlikely that the route uh, would be via Avon Road because there is a, a, sorry there is an existing very good bus service and the proposed bus service would complement this but couldn't be in direct competition with it so it's likely it would take a different route and therefore it's very very unlikely um, that that you would need to accommodate swept paths um, in other, any other direction other than Trent Road uh, so no additional land take would be required and even if um, it was to go um, down Avon Road. I think it's very, very unlikely that any additional land would be required. I think it could be accommodated within um, Avon Road itself. Um, in terms of um, the Roxwell Road um, potential um, um, bus route um, instead of one going through the site, there's a requirement for um, every dwelling in new developments to be within 400 metre walking distance of a bus stop. And therefore, it's absolutely essential that you have a bus route running through the site. Um, early discussions with bus companies indicate that they would not be willing to go in, um, say, the um, Lordship Road uh, roundabout entrance and then go through the site and exit through the new roundabout to the east. Um, in terms of their commercial operation and therefore um, any bus service they would run along Roxwell Road would just purely be along the existing A1060 and not call within the site which me would mean that be uh, the vast majority of um, the development to the north which would not be within 400 metres of, of a bus stop um, and um, as, as 
um, we've, we've said previously, is extremely important um, that new residents have got a choice of modes so they're not reliant on the private car because it is very congested um, along Roxwell Road, particularly in peak hours. Um, and so we need to do everything we can to encourage um, new residents um, to use sustainable transport, um, including buses. I hope that answers your questions. But thank you for that. I, I think that, I mean, my perception from where I'm sitting is that there is no disagreement uh, from the Rittle residents nor from the Avon Road and that area of residents about the, the aims here, but the, the detail of how those are met is what's up for discussion and whether the wording of the, of the suggested motion uh, reflects what the policy board would want officers and members to consider further. I have Councillor Moore and then I'm going to work out a procedural way forward. Thank you, Chair. I just wish to clarify to Councillor Whitehead, I am absolutely in support of sustain and sustainable transport and indeed a bus link. Um, ideally, a sustainable transport link would be a cycleway mixed with uh, pedestrian access. It's the location of this link that um, it just seems um, outrageous given the way that it, it severs the land. So it's it gives us, I hope, a chance to reassess and see if there is a, another possible way forward, um, certainly to meet um, more of the concerns of the Chignall Estate residents as well. So, so we, we have a, a suggested additional recommendation or to, something to be part of the recommendations, which I'll ask Mr Mayfield to read out again uh, in a minute or whoever's got the text of that in front of them. <clears throat> uh, I think that I want to stress at this point uh, that uh, that it is intended, as Councillor Gulliver and others have stressed, that this is in, this is intended to allow officers, encourage officers and others, to uh, to review and see if we're getting the right answer to making this site as sustainable as we can in transport terms. I think there is new information which is coming to the surface all the time and some doubts in some members' minds about the amount of uh, evidence we've had the opportunity to consider so far. So it is designed to not necessarily even rule in or out the bus link. It's meant to say, as I understand the wording of the motion, it's meant to say sustainable transport is, is there to be achieved. Let's ask people, let's have another look at precisely how and take into account the reservations that have been raised about the bus link, take into account the representations that have been made from Rittle about the necessity for it, uh, and so on and so forth. And within that, I would like to think that Lordship Road was, was part of that consideration. I think we can also usefully make, uh, make it clear that the traveller's site entrance is part of that, sorry, the showman's site entrance is part of that consideration. Uh, and so with that in mind, I'd like to look at that particular uh, suggested additional recommendation. Then I'd like to come back to have another word about the point which we haven't discussed yet, which is the uh, the, the manner of, of heating of the housing which is being discussed, and then see if we can move forward from there. So, Councillor Mayfield, do you have the wording of that motion? Uh, Councillor Mayfield, keep on calling people councillors, I'm so sorry. Mr Mayfield, do you have the wording of that motion? Uh, Chairman, probably not as neatly and coherently as Councillor Sosin has it, so it might be best if he reads out what he's already got written down. Chairman, I will read it if, um, if that's acceptable to everybody. The policy board, Chairman, the policy board accepts there are significant doubts about the safety, viability and benefits of the bus link. It therefore refers all the sustainable transport elements for this development to officers. It agrees, if necessary, to convene a special meeting of the board to review the master plan before cabinet. Thank you, Chair. And I would just like to clarify to Councillor Roberts that this is not an adjournment of, of the master plan. It's, uh, it's the need for an additional piece of work before it's recommended to cabinet. So the other recommendations may yet succeed, if you see what I mean. So I understand Councillor Moore, you're still happy to second that motion? Yes, I am, Chair. And so I'm asking whether there is a need for a vote. Are, are we in favour of that motion? If someone has, if wishes, someone wishes to object or abstain, they should please say so now. If someone wishes to object, I will call for a formal vote. Uh, 
Okay, I think that that's carried and added to the recommendations at that stage, which we will consider in turn. So can I just come back to two aspects which we haven't had the chance to debate so far in full? One is the question of the boundary uh, uh, and the, uh, the buffer between Lordship, uh, sorry, between Roxwell Road and the new development. And I think I heard what officers uh, say was that that is to an extent negotiable. I heard very strongly the the need for uh, certain certain criteria to be met in order for the speed limit to, that we would we would need to come into play. Uh, but I think that I would ask the, the the board, with the with the being reassured that the precise depth of that buffer can be still uh, improved by negotiation. I would not like to hold up the master plan for that process. That's my particular my personal view. Is there a contrary view to that? And so the, the other point which hasn't had discussion in quite such detail as it might uh, deserve is the question of how the houses are uh, to be heated, gas versus electricity and other sources of sustainable power. And I know that that's going to come up again in the in the Bloor master plan for north of uh, north of Broomfield. I think the point was mentioned by the officers that actually uh, within the making places document, which is shortly to go out for consultation, is a very clear signal that we would hope to improve on the local plan. We would hope that developers would improve on the local plan in recognising the trend towards ever more sustainable power um, power sources. And, and and fully encourage developers to uh, to anticipate government legislation, which feels as if it's round the corner in this respect, and not uh, dig their heels in. So I think that we need a signal from this board, uh, either now or at the, at the end of the Bloor debate, the North of Broomfield debate, uh, uh, an encouragement of officers to to continue their strong negotiations with developers and encourage developers to. Uh, to participate in, as a willing partner in that trend towards more sustainable power. But we don't have the authority to insist on that because it's not a local plan policy. So uh, does uh, Councillor Willis, you wanted to talk to that a bit, I think. Uh, so I think you've gone back on mute. Right. Yes, I was quite astonished at the presentation of the master plan. Everything had been going very well. I could see all sorts of desirable features in the um, what was proposed. And then one of the, uh, my colleague councillors, I can't remember who it was, um, asked a, a very simple question about how the homes were going to be heated. And suddenly it became apparent that there were no proposals actively being pursued to provide any alternative to the gas central heating, which we all know we've got to leave behind, um, and which indeed um, is, is going to become obsolete in, 19, 20, in 2023. And how you can um, talk about a development where the houses aren't going to be on sale for the most part until 2022 or 2023, um, without knowing how they're going to be heated, quite staggered me. And so, yes, indeed, I, I think this is a, quite a crucial matter. Um, and I would have thought commercial common sense would tell you that by then a developer's got to have a good account of how the houses are going to be heated. And so actually it makes commercial sense as well as um, good planning um, and environmental sense to have the uh, something more advanced that they've obviously begun to consider. And I hope yeah, I noted the, the North Chelmsford plan has a much better attitude to this. These proposals there aren't specific, but there are proposals to, uh, to have a community heating option. And I'm, that's the trend we need to seek for. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Potter, I don't know whether you want to comment on that aspect of it. It has been suggested to me that there, that we should, as a council, be even more proactive than I know you and your colleagues are being and bring developers together uh, in order to discuss and encourage their approach to this, whether it's about uh, uh, this sort of this source of, of, of sustainable heating or another source or solar solar panels or whatever. Uh, and some of those things, of course, will be defined at the planning application stage. 
there's always going to be a bit of a conflict between the cost of some aspects of what we can achieve through uh, through uh, through the uh, planning obligations uh, stage at the planning appli planning application stage. There's always going to be some trade-offs between this advantage and that advantage, but I think there's clear a clear signal from lots of us that this is a high priority item to discuss further with developers. I wondered if you had a comment on that. Yeah, um, I you know um, I totally agree, and um, we will um, do what we can to well we will organise um, some developer forums around the Making Places SPD. So the Making Places SPD is the real sort of um, starting point for for that discussion and hopefully um, um, you know government policy will be speeded up to make sure that we can uh, you know implement um, some of these changes sooner um, than as Councillor Willis was just saying it's actually you know it could be 2025 until some of the full um, um, requirements for the future home standard come in so yeah we would welcome welcome that opportunity and um, you're right. We are we are um, uh, in our negotiations with developers. We are making this, um, you know, a key strand of um, our ask of uh, new developers, even if we don't have at this point in time the requirement for them to not have gas boilers to have a, a different form of uh, heating. Um, so until we can have a policy that says you can't have gas boilers, I'm afraid it is going to be a, a, a negotiation and a nudge. But I do think the development industry will have to um, get wise to this pretty soon. And, um, you know, and then the economies of scale will happen and this will become normal practice. So if you can if you can leave that with me, Chair, in relation to the Making Places SPD, I think that's the best route to ensure that developers know what this council's stance on those matters are. Uh, I'm, I'm happy with that, if the board is happy with that approach to the, that item, because they're bearing in mind that the Making Places SPD is going out for consultation. So there's every opportunity for people to strengthen their representations in that respect if they, they wish. So I think I have Councillor Willis, your hand is still up. Uh, it? it shouldn't be. But um, I, I mean, anyway, yes, I, I'm very happy with what Mr. Potter's just said. Very happy. OK, Councillor Gulliver, your hand is up. I was just going to say it would appear that those developers that are at the cutting edge of developing green housing um, are working on the basis that gas will be the short term solution, but that infrastructure would be turned over to using hydrogen. So you will pipe the hydrogen through the same pipes as they're using for the gas. And there's a development in uh, Bedfordshire going ahead, which is on this basis. And I've seen the papers, Etopia Homes, if you want to look them up, they're Colchester Bates, the company that's building in Bedfordshire. And they're already looking at how hydrogen heats homes. Sounds very interesting. I'm sure Councillor, I'm sure Mr. Potter is making notes as we as we go along and probably is already talking to them. But I think that's a positive way forward with on that particular item. So if I can come back to the recommendations then in the, in the main report, uh, having said that we're going to add to that fourth re recommendation, Mr. Mayfield, could you read the recommendations out uh, one by one? Because there's more than one, isn't there? And, and uh, pause after each one, just to make sure there's no dissent. Yes, Chair. Uh, the first recommendation is the policy board recommend to Cabinet that the master plan attached as Appendix 1 to the report, with any changes arising from the recommendations, be approved. I think that stand still stands and that wording is still appropriate. Second recommendation is yeah, Mark, that before consideration by a Cabinet, the master plan is subject to independent quality and design review undertaken by Essex Quality Review Panel. So I need to pause you there. I have Councillor Sochin who tried to interrupt. I also have Councillor Roberts. Um, I felt that the first one isn't com compatible at that stage with the amendment. Um, uh, they would have to say following the uh, uh, further review, I don't think it's, it's compatible with the uh, amendment we've just passed. 
Okay, so, so perhaps we could include a phrase, Mr. Mayfield, which says subject to recommendation number four or whatever it is. Yes, that would be appropriate, Chair. Yeah. If we could leave that to Mr. Mayfield to make sure that the recommendations don't contradict themselves. Councillor Roberts? Yes, Chairman, I, I have a hand up to talk about electricity. I, I, I do Hello. believe this. I, I, I had it up some time ago, but we did a bit late, but I think you missed it. Um, and I'm pleased to listen to uh, what Mr. Potter said regarding it. Uh, opportunity will be in the making places, SPD consultation. But there is legislation coming along. And, and if it is coming along, the size of the power cables going into the site will need to be substantially bigger. When the when that so that it really needs to be considered early in the process and not leaving it till they've started building with gas pipes. So I think um, I think a great deal of consideration needs to be given to it as we progress. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I think that's I think that's right. I mean, it's a question of whether whether we feel as a board whether we feel we need to note our concern in in some formal way to further encourage officers in this in these conversations with uh, with developers. Uh, I think that I mean it's, it, it's clearly the the meeting is recorded and the and the gist of the meeting's feeling. But if we if we would like to add, the policy board further uh, notes the likely trend away from electric central heating towards other forms of sustainable energy, and further encourages officers to further those conversations with developers. Then I'm happy if that, something like that is noted. Would you like us to do that? Uh, I would, Chairman. Yes, I think it, I think it's it's the right move to make at this point because we've got a lot of development going on in the next twelve years or whatever it is, fifteen yeah. years. Yeah, uh, I mean, and we do need to consider it. Yeah, we, uh, this is not to say, uh, Mr. Potter, that we that we we that we don't think you're doing this already. We realise that you are. We're trying to give you extra weight to uh, to further those conversations. So, Mr. Mayfield, if you could translate that when you're doing the minutes into a into a, an extra, not a recommendation as such, but the the policy board notes additionally. Dot dot dot. Yes, certainly, Chair. I can do that. So, where did we get to in the recommendations? We're up to the third recommendation in the report, which is that the policy board delegate the director of sustainable communities in consultation with the chair, vice chair, and cabinet member for sustainable development development to negotiate the further considerations outlined in this report and other subsequent changes to the master plan ahead of the consideration by cabinet. And I think that relates primary, primarily to tidying up aspects of the uh, of the report and master plan before it goes to cabinet rather than the uh, substantive issue um, uh, on which you accepted the recommendation earlier. Uh, Chairman, I think we should add the uh the spokesperson for the two opposition uh, groups to the uh, to be consulted at least in the or well, advised of the changes. Yeah, I mean we we can't compromise as to how they're involved. I think we would we would expect them to all all of the people that have been mentioned and the, and those two other persons to be fully apprised of, of the changes which are taking shape. Are you happy with that, Councillor Whitehead? I think that I'm never sure whether you or Councillor Gallagher are the Tory leader on this on this group. Well, no, normally speaking, it would be Councillor Gallagher for his expertise in the past. If he's happy to do so, I would be happy for him to help help okay. out in whichever way is appropriate. Excellent. And Councillor Roberts and Councillor Dayton, if you could agree between you, which of you would want to be involved uh, in in that tidying up process? Yes, Chairman. I think uh, we have already agreed it would be me, but I'll fight for it. So uh, yeah, it'll be me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So with, with so having heard those recommendations and with the additional recommendation and the additional comment of the policy board's opinion about uh, about sustainable heating, are we able to agree and move forward? Thank you very much, and I thank you very much indeed for all of your contributions to that. And again, uh, a reassurance to the public and to the organisations representing the public and gathering public opinion here that in a way which is manageable, I have to stress that because we're not talking about a whole new round of expensive full consultations with all the bells and whistles, but in a manner which is manageable, we will continue to involve you and consult you as this takes shape further over the next stages of its development and onwards towards the planning applications. 
So we are in a position to look at the rest of the agenda. Um, my screen is now flickering badly. I'm going to call a two minute comfort break. Uh, it's now 21.32. The question to you is whether we look at the Bloor Master Plan for North of Broomfield or whether we deal with one or two of the other items which may be quicker. Anyone have a view? Well, as we've taken uh, so long to do one master plan, I, I think that uh, the other one uh, was not going to be done in the 25 minutes that are left from the deadline you set earlier, Chairman. I'm glad, I'm glad that someone else said that, otherwise I would have said it. Thank you, Council uh, I've suggested looking at items 8 to 10, which might be quicker. Agreed. Chair, so, with your sorry, with your with your, um, with your agreement, is it possible for coming? Uh, yes, by all means. I just did want to say that we need to take account of the fact that there are uh, whether there are public questioners there uh, in relation to the Bloor master plan. I can't recall without looking it up on my other computer. Um, so we have um, a representative of the council. The thing that I'd like to bring to your attention, Chair, is that item eight, the statement of community involvement, um, is quite time time bound because we were hoping to get on consultation if it was agreed tonight as soon as possible to allow that process to happen for the SCI to be changed so then we can then we can get out on consultation with SPD. So if um, the most time bound item that we have on the agenda left is um, is, is made. Thank you. Oh, OK, so let me let me just address myself to the representative of, of, of the Little Waltham Parish Council, who I assume is, is uh, and ask uh, whether you whether well, I hope that you've had some uh, interest and in some of this uh, master plan so far, the West of Chancellor master plan has been considered in such detail. Uh, and you can look forward to not as lengthy, but a similar uh, similar debate in the context of that, whether you would attend us and we reconvene. I'm afraid I don't know which representative of the parish council it is that's with us to talk. So please join us now. Robertson, I'm the chair of the Waltham Parish Council and you're oh, correct. Yes, hi. Yeah, nice to see you. Right, you're correct, Chair. I've been sitting here for two hours. Two hours forty minutes and thirty seconds. You're not going to have the time to deal with it now. Can I ask when it's done? Though uh, we're giving good notice, of it and we are the first item on the end of the next time. You you put that very politely and very patiently, and the answer to the, uh, both to those questions is absolutely yes. Yeah at the start of the agenda, but, but once those are out of the way, absolutely. I'm very grateful for your indulgence. No, and uh, and in advance, we're grateful for your uh, great interest in the way that that proposal is unfolding. So, so let us go to agenda item eight there. Officers to introduce that item. Um, but let's first of all, two minute break. See you in a couple of minutes.
So just to say that I'm now back, it looks as if most people probably are. I had to feed the cat as well, believe it or not. So I'm not now being pestered to the same extent. So if Chair, could I just mention that we also have uh, a, a member of the public, Phil Jackson, who wanted to speak on the uh, Broomfield Master Plan. Um, uh, so probably the same applies to him as to whether he's happy for, for you to come back to the uh, the adjourned meeting. Yes, Phil. I'm so sorry. I was uh, I was not uh, remembering to ask whether there was a member of the public uh, here to, on that item. Uh, you heard what I was saying in that respect. Are you, uh, with our apologies, are you willing to reconvene, or would you like to give your statement now? Because we can do that if you wish. Yes, yes, okay. I'm happy to come back. Okay, our apologies, but I think you. I hope you agree that the debate has worth been worthwhile in the context of how master plans progress. Yes, Thank I've worked that. within the buildings industry, so I know what these meetings go like. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Thank so, you. if I can, if I can hand the meeting over to the officer who is talking is uh, Jane Robinson. I think is talking to the community involvement item. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Chairman. Good evening, everybody. Um, this I don't think will take too long, um, but it's interesting because it's about community involvement, um, and that's really what we've been talking about with the master plans. Um, we have a statement of community involvement, and um, we we've had this all the way through our local plan, sort of supporting the development of the local plan. It sets out our strategy for involving the community and organisations in um, planning policy and development management functions. Um, the current version was published in 2016, so as you can imagine, it, it's due for an update. Legislation says that we should do that within five years anyway, which would be March 2021. And we were planning to do it a little later in the year, but partly because of the coronavirus situation, we're now um, clearly unable to meet some of our commitments, such as face-to-face -face meetings, placing documents on deposit and that kind of thing. And we have added an explanatory note um, to the current SCI, which is actually just about to be updated. But the government has also issued updated advice, advising that an immediate review is made of current SCI. Um, so that we can allow plan making to continue and that will include consultation on the SPDs. Um, members will have, have seen the document. The content hasn't changed significantly. The legislation tells us what should be included. Um, but we have taken an opportunity to update it to reflect the new local plan and its adoption and also to include the master planning procedure, which we've been talking about, which was agreed by Cabinet in October, um, updating out of date web links, referencing how we might deal with um, situations where there is government advice for exceptional circumstances where we can't meet our commitments. Um, there's one thing I've highlighted here because we, uh, I know there's been some discussion. Um, at the moment, uh, the site notices are posted to notify neighbours and uh, for every planning application. But we um, we will stop. We was we would remove the need now to produce and post notification letters to individual neighbours. Um, that was something agreed under budgetary and resource savings discussions by cabinet um, before the budget was set earlier the, in the year. Um, we're also looking at different ways of doing consultation activity, so more use of social media, digital access to documents, and there's some quite interesting ways. Um, partly generated by the coronavirus situation that people are now consulting on documents and on consultations and we'll be looking to do some of those types of things. Um, you will see that it is only in a text format at the moment but it would be 
designed um, when it's adopted as an interactive version for the website first, obviously with a print document to sort of back that up. There's no requirement to review, uh, sorry, to consult on the review actually, but it has been our practice to do so. Um, and we, we consider that it is best practice to continue to do that. Consultation would start hopefully next week if um, members approve the document for consultation to target statutory stakeholders, um, duty bodies, developers and agents, the public, um, and through a, a variety of means that you see there in the report. So um, in case, unless there are any questions, I commend the recommendations. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. May I see any hands from people who would like to speak? Let me just see who that is. Some of you are some of some of you are not are not using the the H. You're using the other hands. Is it Coun Councillor Poulter? Did you have your hand up? And Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Chairman. Not me. No, not on this one. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Which which of us do you wish to go first? Councillor Poulter, thank you. Right. Um, Jim, you should have had an email from me yesterday in which I set out some proposed amendments that um, I wanted to make, mostly for the sake of clarification. But if I can go through these briefly, um, references are to page numbers on the actual um, document. On page four, under committees, the third bullet point which I would suggest we alter, this is for the sake of clarification and completeness, but that to read, the vast majority of planning applications are determined by officers under delegated powers, but the determination is made by the planning committee for A, changes to buildings which we own, B, applications for planning consent made by our own councillors or our employees, C, applications where ward council requests the determination by the planning committee for an application in his or her own ward, but that request must be for sound planning reasons. Uh, and the director of sustainable communities feels it's appropriate for the planning committee to determine an application. This would only usually be for major applications. And Carrying on on page 22, under We Will, amend the third bullet point to read, publish your comments on our website. The reason I suggest that is that I'm not sure that we do acknowledge all comments that are made by members of the public on planning uh, matters if they're sent in by letter. And on page 22 and 23, because it overlaps, further bullet points under planning matters to read covenants and title deeds and documents, because there seems to be a common misconception by members of the public, and this keeps recurring at planning meetings. And then under, on page 24, under how we make decisions, the third paragraph would need to be amended to to conform with any amendments we made to page four above. Um, that's it. Thank you. <coughs> so thank you for your detailed analysis of that and those detailed suggestions, Councillor Poulter. <coughs> I personally have no problem with them. My first reaction was that as this is going out to consultation, if there are things that need further clarification, we can <coughs> legitimately respond to that effect. <coughs> Uh, and, as, and as can the public and with local members in uh, support to uh, responding to the consultation. But uh, but Jenny, do you see any problem in incorporating those changes? No, not at all. And they can be done before we go out to consultation. Um, it would be useful if Councillor Poulter could just email those through to us just so that we have the exact wording that he's suggesting. We may um, just sort of slightly... Uh, make it slightly less technical, um, but we would definitely include that if you'd like to send that through. So yeah. thank you for those comments. They're very useful. I'll send them through to you tomorrow. Thank you very much. So any other member of the board or indeed any other member wish to participate in this debate? Um, Chairman, I thought that um, 
not all um, applications by officers and councillors went to the um, um, the committee any longer. They used to way back in 2003, but I thought sometime in the last uh, so many years the requirement was reduced uh, to avoid uh, kind of very small applications coming before the um, before the uh, committee. Uh, <clears throat> that may have uh, may have happened in the past. I'm not aware of that, Mr. Potter or or Jenny. Do I, you, are you aware of that, that change? I think oh, it would be good. I, 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 I see Keith bringing Holmes Keith Holmes, if that was all right. Yeah, yeah I, I see Keith has got his hand up. Keith Holmes, uh, for the members of the public, this is a senior one of the senior planning officers who has responsibility for the planning committee. Um, thank you, Chair. Yes, just just to clarify, Councillor Sosin is correct. Um, not not all applications by officers and members, not all applications affecting council land have to go to the planning committee, um, only where there is an objection or a contrary view to the proposal. Um, th this is, these are matters that are covered in the constitution and I, and I would suggest humbly that, uh, that the statement of community in involvement shouldn't commit the council in terms of not being able to amend its constitution where it feels that that's appropriate to do so. Um, so I have those concerns about Councillor Poulter's proposal. Oh, about, about, about Councillor Poulter's proposal? Or, uh, or or about Councillor Sochin's reservations or question? No, I, what I'm saying is that Councillor Poulter's proposed amendments in effect are, re, are, are putting in, um, with due respect, slightly erroneous um, points about uh, what does go to committee. Uh, and what does go to committee and what doesn't go to committee is a matter for the Constitution. And I would suggest that, that if it goes into the statement of community involvement, then it may fetter the council's ability to amend its constitution where it where it so wishes in these circumstances, um, which is where at the moment the scheme of delegation is uh, sits. So two points. One is if that we are going to put uh, additional text in the statement of community involvement, we need to be clear that it's it's accurate. Uh, and secondly, I'm not sure that the statement of community involvement is the right place to uh, reproduce what's actually in the scheme of delegation that's in the Constitution. That's just my point. Uh, Chairman, may I? Yes, of course. Yeah, um, I can't say that anything in the statement of community involvement will inhibit the Council in amending its Constitution. But I take Mr Holmes' points. There is... Some, some of the matters that I raised are perfectly valid. Some may, be, may need to be reconsidered by officers before the documents are put out for public consultation. My purpose in making these proposed amendments is so that the public can see what the actual situation is without having to look through the, the Constitution. It is so that they can contribute to the debate and make any amendments that they consider necessary when doing so, that they have a full statement of facts before them. But I leave it to officers to make amendments or not as appropriate. Thank you. No, thank you for that, Chairman. Um, clearly, I, I, don't, I, I don't think that you're intending to rewrite the Constitution through your amendments, and clearly any changes that, uh, that Jenny Robinson makes to this uh, in, in taking it out for, cons for consultation needs to accurately reflect what it is that we do and invite consultation responses. If there are aspects of your amendments which would require a constitutional change, then that needs to be a response to the consultation and be taken through different, a different route. So can you, when you're, when you're finalising that with, with Jerry Robertson and Mr Holmes, can you just have that in mind and, and take into account that that's a reservation which needs to be overcome? Keith, have you still got your hand up? No, sorry, I'm I'm done. Sorry. Thank you. No, it's easily done. <clears throat> so, with with that <clears throat> with that element of the debate, uh, are we able to accept the recommendation? 
that we approve the document and subject to those amendments of further tidying up to go out for consultation. Agreed. Thank you very much. Agreed. How are we doing for time? That was good. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, right, we have seven minutes. So what is agenda item nine? Refresh my memory someone. It's gone off my screen. Um, an update on neighbourhood plans. Updates, just to, yes. OK, let's have a go at that. That's okay. you, Jenny, is it? Yes, it is. I'll just open the report, won't keep you a moment. Um, this is literally just a, a factual update on um, where neighbourhood plans are within our administrative area. Because we've now adopted the local plan, all the neighbourhood plans, when they're adopted or made, as we call it, will actually become part of the um, local plan itself. So this report is just to update members on on where we are. I won't go into too much detail. I think generally the background is rather well known now about how neighbourhood plans work and where they've come from. Um, the We have eight groups active at the moment on neighbourhood plans and they're at different stages as you'll see. Um, it's a voluntary thing. It relies on parish council members working in their communities. And I think many of our um, members will also be involved. And the city council supports them. We advise on the process, share data, share evidence, um, and help um, bring the plans forward. Um, We've done quite a bit already, obviously, with these plans because some of them have been going, some of the groups have been going since 2016. So it's a, a fairly long, long term support. Um, there are formal steps which we which we're sort of beginning to get involved with now where the groups are consulting on their plans. That's called a regulation 14 consultation. They refine the plan and then we ourselves do a, a more formal sort of final consultation before it goes for um, an independent examination. And then a referendum um, of the area covered by the plan before we adopt it. So there's still some way to go um, on all of these plans. Um, the, in fact, the um, Statement of Community Involvement Review has a lot more detail about those steps within it because it's about consultation and, and getting people involved. Um, and then below that is really a list of um, a summary of where all the different groups are up to. And I don't intend to talk through those in any detail, Chairman, but um, members may be interested to read those details. Um, I would just like to say really for um, anybody involved in the neighbourhood plans, it's a, a significant commitment of time and energy from the groups involved. Um, you know, that is to be commended. It is about getting local people involved with local matters. And of course, the council will continue to support neighbourhood plan groups as they go forward in the future, existing ones and any new ones, of course, too, who, who do come on board. Um, happy to answer any questions and then um, just commend the um, report to members um, to be noted. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Any member of the board like to participate, comment, raise a question? From my personal point of view, although these are quite time intensive and quite demanding documents, I think they do, as Jenny said, give the local community the maximum possible opportunity to participate in the, the process of how their neighbourhood develops. And I, it's interesting to note that in one or two areas of the one of the two of the non parished areas, something really quite similar has evolved. Uh, for example, around Fox Credit, uh, Fox Crescent and debate about the future of the St Peter's site has effectively engaged the community in the same way that a neighbourhood plan would enable would enable that engagement to be grounded. So I think that the process has a lot of merit uh, and it is time consuming, but it, it is the way in which it, over time a longer term vision from the local community can be reflected in the various aspects of the planning process. So thank you for the hard work, Jay. It is a long and protracted business, I know. Thank you. Any of the any of the board members want to say anything about their own experience in their own parishes if they're in the middle of this process? Mm. 
No, the event will allow me to wind the meeting up two minutes early. In that case, or at least we'll have these two minutes to decide what we're doing about our next date. So thank you all very much for that. Uh, what I would suggest is that uh, Councillor Mayfield, sorry, Councillor Mayfield, that Mr Mayfield comes back to us with a suggested date uh, to reconvene. Uh, he can clarify one point for me. I'm assuming that this is, uh, it would be permitted for uh, different substitutes to attend that meeting as it's a different agenda item. Would that be accurate, Mr Mayfield? Yes, Chair, that is the case. So different substitutes can attend the uh, reconvene meeting. Okay, so so with that, with that proviso, I would like to Thank you all again for your involvement in the debate that we've had this evening. Hope Chairman, that you agree. The, um, uh, which I think we're noting the um, proposed uh, timetable. I think perhaps reconsideration ought to be given uh, to how long the neighbourhood, uh, uh, the sorry, the master plans take, um, and whether they should be combined with a whole agenda that um, is put forward later in the year um some rethought to that given that this took two and a half hours and there are some pretty big ones coming back in the second half of the year uh, and i just suggest that officers take another look at that perhaps thank you I, I cer certainly i would agree with you and i'm sure uh, if councillor mccrory is still with us i'm sure that uh, that he and i and uh, the planning officers will look at that and and take uh, take some lessons from the way that these two master plans have reached the stage that they have reached uh, and uh, and see where we go from here i think i think that this has been partly a catch-up process with those two master plans and it will be slightly simpler but i but i would agree that we don't need to give them short we, we can't give them short shift and if that needs better timetabling then so be it mr potter Yes, so thank you, Chair. I think um, obviously this is the first one that's got to this stage um, and we will reflect um, in, in, in relation to how long it takes and for the board to give it due consideration. Um, so, I mean, the items we, we, we have two, well, two substantive items left over. Um, and I am um, the north of Broomfield master plan um, is still obviously slightly time bound in the sense that um, um, consideration on, on that to get that to a cabinet if um, if that is uh, doesn't require as much uh, change. Um, but um, I was just wondering when we were thinking, are we thinking in the next couple of weeks for a reconvened meeting? Is that the kind of idea? I, I, I personally i don't have the council timetable in front of me so i can't see what the clashes might be but if uh, thursdays tend to be policy board days and if it's next thursday then it would probably work for me but i don't know i can't off the top of my head i don't know that's fine thank you chair it's just to get the time scale so it would be relatively imminent it's the the next slot that um policy board can make that would be great thank you S seamless process jeremy seamless yeah yeah. OK, so are there any other closing remarks from people? We did have a public question in relation to the Rams item on the agenda, didn't we? Was that one that was going to be read out, though, I believe? Yes, Chair, I was going to read that out on behalf of the person who submitted it. So um, so we should just inform we should just inform them of what's I, happened. I intend to, yes. Thank you very much. So on that note, uh, I wish you all a very good evening and thank you very much for your involvement. Sleep Thank well. You, Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you.